will be clicking for Heather to see if she's on. <clears throat> Today, try it on here and get Heather to join. Find me real quick. All right, let's see. Come on. Some people be on there online, so let's see if she gets this. But here we go. All right. She's not on yet. So, anyways. Wasn't able to be on last week, but wanted to go live again and try to talk about narcissism and some things like that, how it's affected my life, kind of my story along with it, and talk through just any questions that people might have, any thoughts about narcissism. So hopefully you've seen some of my videos, some of the things that have been posting about narcissism, about lies, about a bunch of different things that narcissists struggle with, and so that's really like what we're here for. So the chat about narcissism, chat about how it affects different people, chat about what you guys go through with it. Um, I might keep like glancing here to see if Heather's going to join real quick. Um, I'll message her on Facebook because that seems to be what she uses the most. But yeah, anyways, so would love to see who's all here as far as like what y'all's experience is as far as like working with a narcissist, having a narcissistic partner, ex, anything like that. So, hey there, Chris. How's it going today? All right. I am on now. There we go, messenger. Husband is a textbook narcissist, but said he's not. It's insanity, cheating, gaslighting, up oh, issues, and and then he just left you. Gosh, I'm sorry about that. It is crazy. After 30 years, especially. I'll get her added here in just a second. Diagnosed narcissist ever respect you if you constantly forgive him? Not if you not if you don't set boundaries and your forgiveness just looks like enabling. Like if you're just enabling him to do the next thing because oh I forgive you, but then he doesn't change and you don't have any consequences or boundaries set, then they're just gonna keep doing the same thing. Mother, husband, mother in law, sister in law, holy cow, that is a lot of narcissists in your life. For sure, that's, I mean, that's not something to laugh about, but that's crazy. Using the legal system can you need abuse. Um, that makes sense that they, uh, that's right, or ever stop cheating. Um, the stopping cheating part, like, that's something that really comes down to them internally. Like, are they actually going to make a change, make a stop? Are they going to make a, a heart change that's actually going to change something um, instead of it just being conformity? So I don't know if you saw my recent video, but like I talk about a little bit about like Christianity and like conformity about like how a lot of Christianity out there just wants people to like conform, like just do the right thing, say the right thing, be the right person. And in reality, like it does nothing. It doesn't help anything. And like a narcissist is perfect at that. at saying, doing, being, thinking, pretending to be the right, right person when they're actually not, you know, um, Sorry, so I can bite. But yeah, that's something that like is really hard. Hey there. Hey there. Welcome. Thank you. Just started to get some people on. Yep. So I've got like ten over here already. There's a couple people already asking some questions. I was talking through a couple of things. Okay, um, perfect. Yeah. Um... Hey Chris. <laughs> Some boundaries work and others don't. I mean, there's not necessarily like one way or one boundary that's gonna, going to work, you know, for a narcissist. But I think following up on the boundaries and following up on here's the line. If you cross it, this is what happens. I think a lot of times boundaries don't work because there's no set consequences. There's no set 
action or reaction that's going to happen from those boundaries. And as a result, boundaries don't work. They're just like rubber bands to be broken constantly because they know there's no recourse from it. Um, well, and the boundary really isn't for them. It's for you. Yeah. Like for your own like sanity. True. So if, if you tell them, if you yell at me again, I'm leaving and they turn around and yell, you get up and leave, but you know, you have to be able to follow through. Mm -hmm. Hi there. Hail. Yes. <laughs> he says, I, they love this live duel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's good. Uh, yeah, they view boundaries as a challenge. Yeah, 100%. I think I made at least one video about this. Like, as a narcissist, like, thinking of a boundary, like, it looks like a challenge. It looks like, how can I break this? How can I get to the edge and step over? It's it's very childish. It's like a, like a two-year-old kind of thing. Like, don't touch this, and you go up and you touch it, or you see how close you can get. Whitney, hi, babe. Can I make you um, a moderator? Let me know if that's okay. We're starting to get more trolls now. <laughs> I forget how to do that. How do I make people moderators? You like, you like click on their name and then you click on manage and then you click on make moderator. Oh, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, the name calling is terrible. Chris can mod, let me get you there. Whitney and Chris can mod, that's awesome. So one of the things that Ben and I found out is that when we were on live with Lee, um, comments it was were horrific. crazy busy. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't horrific. The comments weren't, but we couldn't read them. Like we were trying so hard and they were just moving so fast. And like, even when you only have like 20 people on, it still moves fast. So, uh-oh, Gus is here, Lee. Um, <laughs> hi, Lee. <laughs> But it was like um, a these ticker. comments it was just like constant, like oh my God. couldn't keep up with it. We couldn't. It was like a blur. So um, we've decided to add some people that are moderators who know um, about narcissism, who can help answer people's questions. If we don't see them, you're still going to get responded to by somebody that we individually know and trust. So we do, we don't want anybody to not be heard, but it's it's really hard. Lee is a beast. <laughs> we're getting lots of folks over here. Hi, everyone. So we're just getting started. Yep. Hey, y'all. Hmm. Yeah, it's been like hectic. The past two weeks have been like insane hectic for me. So I haven't had a chance to do a live or do much of anything. And I'm about used up of all my draft videos. You can always tell like when the shirt changes, you know, <laughs> you're like, <laughs> I'm about through with all of them. There is one, there is one day that um, like we swapped cars, uh, Kayla and I swapped cars and I left my laptop and stuff in there. So like by the time I got home, I didn't have anything like work-wise that I could work on. So I just had my phone and I was like, all right. So I just started recording a bunch of TikToks, saved a bunch, and then that's how it works. So it helps, it helps me get through my week since I work Sunday through Wednesday and it's going to be like 10 to 12 hour days. That's how I'm able to keep posting. Mm -hmm. I just get a bunch of drafts ready and then throw them up. But I feel like I I've need... been falling behind, like responding to people or getting like people's questions answered. But I need to start doing drafts, more more drafts. I'll do them every once in a while, but I need to start doing that. Um, sometimes you feel like you're so mean to them having to defend yourself. Well, they get you to a point where you're not really acting like yourself anymore. Like if you think about it, how could you, as hard as you try, stay who you are when somebody is calling you atrocious names and screaming at you and stealing your things or stonewalling you? I mean, it's not a normal relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you take on the traits because you're getting. Oh, hey, Corey, I think you, I think you and I were supposed to do a live as well. We need to talk. <laughs> yeah. Um. But so yeah, you take on their 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 traits because you're getting their habits. That yeah, that that can happen. Or like you're so tired of it. Mm hmm. Like yeah. the re we're getting reactive abuse questions here too. 
Yeah, so like about reactive so did, abuse. yeah, they're just saying that the, what what can happen is reactive abuse. Mm -hmm. I really hate that because it's not. I don't like the ter terminology because I the victim is not an abuser. I really think it's. I really feel like we should start talking about it as a an abuse response. You know, like a reactive like emotion because it definitely is like reactive, but it's not necessarily like meant to be or intentionally like abusive. It's just. And once it's trying to fight fire with fire, hoping that there's some way to survive it. Right. Yeah, I know. I didn't recognize myself either. And then and that's how I started to really realize I had to get out is because my friends were saying, like, you're not the same. You're usually so sunshiny and you just seem so stressed and all of that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I know you said you might have a story and I don't know if you wanted to kick off with that or what. Uh, I'm gonna wait a couple minutes. You, you're gonna wait. Okay. <laughs> you, you, I have no idea what the story is. You guys, he just told me there's a there's a story. So. No, I had the yeah, I had a, so... I had a story, and I'll I'll share it here in a few. But it was a little crazy thing happened this past week. So, but yeah, fits in with the narcissism stuff. And so everything. I know somebody. I'm. I think this is someone new to me. I want to make sure I follow. She just has a, had a newborn and is really scared to leave. I I bet you are. I mean, that's a really terrible situation. I'm so sorry, but it's never. It doesn't get better. It's going to keep getting worse. There's never a good time. That's for sure. Savage Empath is here. Yay! She's one of my moderators. If you all want some really like, like hard truths um, for <laughs> healing empaths, if you're ready for her, you go follow Savage Empath. Um, but yeah, um, I was trying to think there's a couple different things. I don't know. Um, oh yeah. And I did tag you in the, the long video. So I put up a long video mm -hmm. today. So it's a really good conversation, like with my pastor, like we were talking about like a bunch of different stuff, but like one of the things that like I was talking to him about was just about like lies and how like lies, like block people from actually getting to the truth and understanding like what's going on. And like, um, I feel like a lot of times, like, christianity as a whole um like people don't really address like the lies that stop people to get to any type of realization or revelation about themselves or about like what they believe in um and it's just kind of crazy like we had like a really good conversation about it just a lot of times when you apply that to like so many areas of your life it applies to like the narcissist and things like that because of the fact that like they're built around lies they're built around the lies that they tell themselves they're built around the lies that they tell each other like everyone else and they're built around like the lies that they believe about themselves and others and God and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting because a lot of us will, will realize that they even lie about like good things. Like they don't even tell mm -hmm. the truth if they did something good sometimes. And then it took me forever to realize that part of that is also just a power and control thing. Right. Right. So. Yeah. If they can like control the conversation or if they can manipulate the response, then that, gives in that aspect of control, which is very satisfying for the narcissist. Mm -hmm. It's really hard on the other side to understand any of this, right? When you're in it until you start learning about it, because it, it, it none of it makes any sense to somebody, you know, you, you would think like, well, c open communication will improve a relationship, right? Because mm -hmm. that's a traditional advice. Like it's both people, both people have to participate, both people but that's not the reality. When you're in an abusive relationship, only one person is responsible for what's happening in that relationship, and that's the abuser. Right. There's no way to please an abuser unless they become super self-aware, like like Ben and Lee, who are very rare, as I always say, who are willing to face themselves. But otherwise, and you will try everything. You will try every single thing a therapist has ever told you to try to make it work, and it won't because they won't reciprocate. Um, for the most part, again, unless you're more rare. Yeah. And I mean, I think you guys are honestly in the top percent. I mean, there it, it is so rare for narcissists to get to the point that that you are. Um, I mean, I, I don't have research. On, I'm just saying it's so incredibly rare. Um, yeah. I mean, the crazy thing is like, like I look back at at who I was a year ago and it doesn't even seem like who I am now. And I look back at myself like three years ago and it 
like doesn't even I don't even like recognize myself like beginning of marriage like Kayla would tell me stories sometime of like how our marriage was or how I was and like I'm just like I did that like I responded that way over that and but like a lot of times I don't even remember that kind of stuff anymore but um yeah like, she does oops his internet is cutting out I was just saying, but she does. That's yeah. the that's the big thing is victims of abuse. We we remember mm -hmm. because those are like pivotal core memories, right? That that um, you you know, it's hard it's hard to erase. And so I'm glad that you allow her to talk to you about that. You know. Yeah, really, like lying. That's like important someone, for her. Someone asked me, like lying, like how can you look at someone who cares about you in the face and lie to their face and like for a narcissist you don't normally connect the dots that way you don't normally look at someone and be like hey you're loving let me lie to you it's more or less like um like hey i have shame i'm gonna lie to cover up how i feel or hey i don't think that you're gonna be able to handle who i am as a person so i'm gonna lie that way i feel better or hey like i want this response so i know if i lie i'll be able to get what i want but it never like when you when you put it in the narcissist realm like it's really not about the other person it's about the narcissist so like as a result like lying becomes easy if the only agenda in the narc's mind is self-preservation you know but when you start actually having to think about someone else and actually view the other person as being like hey i'm going to love and care about that person that's when you start getting that open honest communication that communication that's like hey like, this might hurt or this might be bad, but, like, I need to communicate open and honest about what's going on versus just lying and pushing it off because that doesn't help anything. Mm -mm. Yeah, so many lies in our can. And on my side, people are talking about couples counseling, and so I'm just going to reiterate what I've said, and all, many of us have said a million times. Couples counseling with a narcissist, except in very extremely rare situations, is never going to work. They will um, be abusive to you before the sessions. They'll definitely be abusive after if it's in the car. I mean, I wouldn't even be getting in a car with a narcissist anymore. Honestly, um, they're dangerous in the car as well. But um, or or days later, mm -hmm. you know, they'll be so angry with you for bringing up something that's actually happened to the therapist. They might try to intimidate you not to say anything. Um, and the um, techniques that they share in traditional therapy for couples is meant for healthy people who want to improve their relationship. If you have one person that's that unhealthy and that disordered, it's not going to work. So what you need to do is get your own therapist, right. get your own, you know, you need to work on you and fix, you know, address the traumas that you have that are keeping you in this relationship and develop an exit strategy or get with a coach, you know, um, and I mean, it's, it's really interesting though, when you do get the therapy for yourself, it's like something you do just for you. Sometimes the narcissist will try to prevent you from going to therapy. So mm -hmm. another thing you might want to try is if it's possible is going when at a time where maybe, I don't know, they're at work or they're otherwise occupied. Um, some narcissists will try to stop you. Yeah. So I would definitely a hundred percent like agree with that like couples counseling with a narcissist i think is a dangerous playground for the narcissist because they're able to lie and manipulate the therapist very easily and then also they can use typically they, they can use tidbits in the therapy session to be able to justify their behavior or to be able to justify like what the other person is doing or saying and and honestly like in this particular topic i would even warn people away from like any type of like Christian counseling when it comes to like dealing with oh, a narcissist God. because like how, how traditional like Christianity, like counseling goes is like very, very open playground for a narcissist. So like give me, give me an example. So like we recently, I recently just fired our couples counselor. Like we went to him like four times and we're going with someone else now, but like, but like I started picking up on stuff. Um, it was a, it was, through friend of a friend like that knew this guy and so like we went and we like tried it out and it was just not beneficial at all but like as i'm sitting there i'm picking up on phrases and i'm picking up on things that he's like saying that 
might be good and like biblical in some ways from like a Christian perspective. But when it comes down to it, like it's not addressing the heart of the problem. It's not addressing like the narcissist It's not addressing like where we are, the triggers that we fight day to day battles. And as a result, there's things that he's saying that I'm picking up on that. I'm like, like a year ago, like I would have this in the bag. Like a year ago, like walking out of Mm -hmm. here, I could use this phrase, this phrase, and this phrase to be able to prove to my wife that she's the reason why I'm this way. And Mm -hmm. like, that's the Mm -hmm. thing that's really dangerous about couples counseling and especially couples counseling from like a Christian perspective. Um, Let me think of a, so like, um, okay, so here's an example. So in, in this counseling that we, that we were, that we did, I think we only did it like four times and then we were just like, no, um, um, like he wanted us to like sit down and like read the Bible together. So good thing, you know? And then, um, he was like, you know, how he asked Kayla, it was something he was like, how are you making it? Um, like, are you making it like welcoming for him to do that or whatever? And like, like he gave, illust- Oh, I'm going to get so mad. He gave, illust- <laughs> he gave like an illustration of like, is the house picked up or like stuff like that. And I was just like, in my mind, I was just like, are you freaking kidding me? Like, this is not helpful. This is not building up like a healthy relationship. This is saying, you know, if you don't live, if you don't conform, if you don't live a certain way, if you don't respect your husband a certain way or do something a certain way, then that's the reason why he's not leading you. And I was like, no, like it has nothing to do with that. Like we have to actually get to the problem, which is not like if the house is picked up, it's like a heart matter. Uh, of, so like, how this person... Yeah. So it was like crazy. So like we, we only went with them like four times and like I started picking up on phrases and I started picking up on things that I was like a year ago, like I could walk out of this and put her in tears easily because like, I know exactly oh, sure. how to manipulate all of the stuff he's saying to be like, see, like, you know, he said this tiny phrase, I can extrapolate that and make you feel like a bad wife because like, obviously like you're not making it an easy, play, easy environment for me to lead or something like it's oh, just it's, crazy. Yeah. Like it's so dangerous. And I don't know if you know this about me. I don't know if I've told you and Lee this yet, but um, I went to a Christian middle school, high school and college. Um, and I used to be a Lutheran school teacher, Missouri Synod. And I actually have an additional degree that they call the minister of the word, even though Missouri Synod Church, you can't be a pastor. I, you know, they basically make you get it if you're going to teach in Lutheran schools. Okay. And um, I went to college with a bunch of kids that were going to be pastors. These in pre-sem and stuff, they don't even, they don't even take psychology classes. Like I actually double majored in psych. Mm -hmm. So like, it's really scary to me. And I don't know what they do now, but back then, um, my understanding when they went to seminary is that there's very little, um, education that would be considered appropriate to be counseling people in the first place. Mm -hmm. So they put all this emphasis on like, you know, the Bible and like these traditional roles and, you know, and I'm not going, we don't have to get into this right now, but if any of you watch my friend mending me, a big part of that is the wife is supposed to be submissive to the husband in every way. If you get my drift and it's, uh, it's very scary to me to to think about that because it's so dangerous. So I left the church. Like I'm spiritual, but I left the church I don't know in 2007 or something. There was just so much that was going on and I have respect for everybody's beliefs, but the things that I saw because of the roles that I, you know, was in, it was really right. It 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 can it can it can be um a it can be permission to abuse further mm-hmm. in those Christian counseling sessions. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like you were just saying. Yeah, hundred percent. So I definitely would, I definitely would caution and deter people away from couples counseling. Period, and definitely like Christian couples counseling because I would say as a whole they're not equipped to be able to handle that. Because I would say a majority of mainstream Christianity doesn't even believe in narcissism. You know, they just believe like, oh, they're sinful or they have pride, you know, but it's, it's a lot more than that. Well, and I think part of that might be because there's so many narcissists in those roles. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's crazy. Um, and not all. And again, I'm not saying that, but there, I have, I've seen some things in some churches and it's, uh, I don't think that they want to address it. Right. Right. Or even, very true. or even. Yeah, it's uh, 
I'm glad you said that. I think that, yeah, individual therapy for you or like I'm a life coach, you guys can set up discovery call with me if you want to. It's in my bio. But therapist for sure first. If you can't have a therapist, you can work with coach. Some of my clients work with both. Um, but get it on your own. Do this for yourself. Invest in yourself. Yeah. 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 yeah Savage Empath is saying it can keep you in an unsafe environment under the guise of working on the relationship. Yes, indeed. Mm-hmm. Or like that's what you're supposed to do or obligated to do or the, the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Ginger's right. A relationship requires two to work on it. And in narc relationships, it's just going to be you. It, it, it will never work. For sure. Uh, someone asked, uh, what's the, um, Gon Kosa asked, what's the correlation between narcissism and uh, misogyny? That, did I say it right? No, that's huge. Yeah. That's like, oh, sorry. My dog is once again (laughs) trying to interrupt us because he's so jealous of me spending time with anybody else. Um, (laughs) So the connection, sorry, the connection between misogyny and narcissism. Mm -hmm. I can just tell you that not all misogynists are narcissists, but I will, I, all the research points to most narcissists um, are misogynists for sure. Um, what if, what if it's the yeah, what if it's the other way around? What if it's the girl that's a narcissist? Well, I mean, you definitely have internalized misogyny because of the church and things like that and the patriarchy. Um, I know my mother is a raging narcissist. I just did a video on how she's stalking me again, mm-hmm. um, but she's a huge racist. Like, but is they she, always have, does she have, have some... that contempt like towards other women or other men or just people in general? Oh, she's contemptuous of everybody. Right. You know, and and I got I got to tell you, I mean, I I have to say she's she's not that bright of a person to be honest with you. I mean, she, it's very she's very surface, but yeah, mm-hmm. she's I was going to do a video on this. I haven't done it yet, but I remember we were one of the last times before we divorced them, we were out to breakfast with them and she was, you know, she has this thing she does. So she's like, you know, I want my bacon crisp and my toast hot. Like just like that to the server, right? And I'm like fuming and my daughter is there and my daughter is like not quite four years old yet. Mm -hmm. And as the server is giving her the food, she literally takes the plate and pushes it back and said, no, I said bacon crisp and toast hot. And I was like, are you kidding me right now? Like it was so like she didn't even have the food. She didn't even see it. So she then, of course, didn't want to leave a tip. So. Um, my daughter's dad and I left her $30 with a note, with a note that said, nobody deserves that kind of treatment. I'm so sorry. And I mean, that's just how she generally was. So anybody that they can try to be better than or above in their minds, they'll, they'll do that female or male. Yeah, for sure. You know? Yeah. My, my therapist has a, a narcissistic mom as well. So it's interesting to how it, how it correlates and how she's able to like talk through stuff and even give examples like of her own stuff, like how she has to set boundaries mm-hmm. with her mom, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's awful. And you know, in my case, like a lot of us, I hit the jackpot cause I'm almost certain my father is ASPD antisocial. Mm-hmm. So they're like the perfect couple. <laughs> right, right. It's just, Oh yeah, I'm sure you have pink. Hey, pink witch, I'm sure you have stories about your mother-in-law. <laughs> but what about your? So it's a little different with your parents, right? Like, do they like coddle you and let you talk trash about your wife and go after her, or are you and your wife more of a unit where that's not a thing that would happen? Mine, like yeah, no, like my parents wouldn't let me try talk trash about her at all. You know, if anything, they like, they like love and care about her. They're, they're more, they're more on the opposite side. They're more of like the overbearing, overprotective, like wanting to be over involved, things like that, than they are like disconnected or um, enabling or anything like that. If anything, there was a lot more like boundaries and rules growing up and a lot of more like restrictions on me and things like that and as a result like Mm -hmm. I pushed those I wanted to see what was on the other side and you know I didn't didn't open up to them emotionally because I knew hey if I opened up you know about this then I'm going to have to um 
like I'm going to get this response. And so if I don't want this response, I don't tell them this. And as a result, like that kind of started mm-hmm. off just, you know, the lies and then the boundary breaking of like, I know they wouldn't like this. You know, you know, I, I know they wouldn't know they wouldn't like me to watch a, this movie or something like that. So I figure out, okay, how do I watch this movie without them knowing it? You know, so a lying way to do it, a deceptive way to do it. And, you know, little by little, just kind of, kept escalating you know yeah so that's great because a lot of us have dealt with the narc golden child man boy Mm -hmm. (laughs) and whose mother like is just completely enabling and you know worse sometimes so i'm glad i'm glad that's not the case yeah um i think sometimes they have i think sometimes my dad has narcissistic tendencies as far as like his like phrasing and speech and like frustrations at times but like he's definitely like nowhere near close to what I've been or how I've acted or things like that so like he struggled mm-hmm. with he struggled with like some anger issues and some things like that and sometimes like the phrasing about stuff is might not be like the best um like emotionally like building up but it's also like he's not He's not being like mean or derogatory. Like it's just some mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah, I think some stuff like that. It's like not really aware of of how it might be portrayed or how it might come across. But like going going through a lot of stuff. Sometimes there's like a phrase that I'll pick up on that I'm like, you know that that doesn't that doesn't offer a safe emotional environment. But it also wasn't like attacking. It was more just like a slight in one sense. Um, mm. I definitely don't think he's like on the scale near as what I am, <laughs> but. But yeah, so. Yeah, so, yeah, Corey, I know your parents are narcissists, covert narcissists, yeah. So it's interesting because they're, oh, I, I downloaded the book. I don't think, I don't think it's charged. It's called, Be- Sorry to Any Baby Boomers. This is not against you, but this book is called Something Like Baby Boomers, The Generation of Sociopaths. So I downloaded it because there is this really fascinating research on all this where older baby boomers or traditionalist parents, so that we're talking about people that are now like in their 70s and older mm-hmm. or late 60s and older, um, there is there are significantly more higher percentage of those people being abusive parents, being on the cluster B spectrum, you know, narcissistic sociopath tendencies. A lot of it stems from generational trauma from the wars, a lot of alcoholism, um, you know, things like that, anger management. There was, you know, they did, there wasn't therapy. They, you know, really back then, um, that's where, that's where there's a big connection with a lot of them. And again, not all of them, but the baby boomers are such a big generation that like, you can almost split them in half, but there is that those traits come out, even if they're not fully narcissistic or something like that. It's, right. it's really interesting. It is interesting. I don't have any new questions over here. Okay. My people are all just, dis- <laughs> They're all talking to each other, which is awesome. Right. I love that. Oh, Le Disco Mama's here. Hey, babe, how are you? <laughs> yeah, nar- your mom's a boomer with major narc traits. Same. Mm-hmm. Do narcissists actually care? Are they capable of care? So I would say, like, typically they don't ever care, and they're not capable of care. They're not capable of care unless they're able to actually get rid of the lies and look past themselves and see someone else besides themselves. If all you see is you, then you can't really like care for anyone else if you're your biggest person, fan, blocking you from actually being able to love or care or connect with anyone. So Lee is saying, um, and I love I love this about some of his videos where he inserts this. He's saying, "How are they treating you?" So that's like the way. If go back and watch some of these videos, but the way that he explains it is basically doesn't really matter what they say 
It doesn't matter if they say they're going to change or whatever. How are they treating you? Are they showing? Is it in action? Because narcissists will tell you shit all day long that they never intend to do, that they're never going to, you know, from saying they're going to get an oil change to and whatever it is, right? They'll say what they need to say in the moment. So are their actions showing you that they care about you? Right. You know, that's... Yeah, no, very true. So sometimes I think they might believe in the beginning that they actually do care, but most of the times it's just a means to an end. It's just uh, it's love bombing, and it's you know you have to say the things that you need to say to be able to get the desired results. And so as a result, like that care, that care looks like care, but it's not actually. It's just trying to get to the end, love bombing. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Oh, geez. Sarah Jessica. Wow. Are you going to do a video on that? He sent the new supply to her house. She's saying. Really? That's. <laughs> <sighs> That's crazy. So, um, so I had <laughs> story time. So I had, um, I had a person at work that was like, Hey, I need to talk to you sometime. And I was like, okay, like, it's someone that I work with and um, I thought it was about like a couple like transitions like coming up and work. And then this person is like, um, this one was like, Hey, like I need to talk to you sometime. So I was like, okay. Ended up talking to her after work one time and this past, uh, it was like a week, week and a half ago. And she ended up talking to me and saying like, I think I might have some misguided feelings for you. And this happened this week? I, yeah, uh, like a week and a half ago. And I just like, I just like, I was like, what? I was like, what the hell is going on? Like, there is not a neon sign over my head seeing come after me. Like, literally, I'm not flirting with this person. I'm not interacting in any way. And this person's like, um, I think I have like misguided feelings for me. And I'm like, I'm not attracted to you. Like, you're, I don't know, almost like 10 years older than me. You have a husband and like multiple kids. Like, what the and hell is you're married with? yes and like she also knows like some of my story like she's she's seen some of my instagram stuff like she's seen some of my posts she knows about narcissism she knows like uh, some stuff i'm like struggling with and she was like you know i don't want to i don't want to make anything worse for you because i know like you've been struggling some and i know like your marriage has been struggling some like from like some of my posts and all but she's like uh i just wanted to like tell you and i was just like what the heck and it was, it was one of those days that, like, I left work. I went to Starbucks because I was going to be um, – I was doing, like, devotions before I went home, so I wouldn't fall asleep. And um, she, like, texted saying that she was at, like, Popeye's, which is, like, right across the road. And, like, once I saw that and, like, she ended up, like, hinting, like, maybe I'll stop by and grab coffee, I, like, backed up my stuff and I, like, left. I was, like, out of there. And I, like, got home and I, like, walked in and Kayla was, like, how was your day? And I was, like – well, let me tell you, like, this is, like, crazy of, like, what was going on. And, like, for me, like, that was also, like, a groundbreaking moment because, like, when it happened and when, like, the conversation was happening and going down, like, I was, like, like, the other person, like, literally said, like, twice, they were, like, like, hey, like, delete this before you go home. And I was, like, been there, done that. I've got the T-shirt. I'm not going down that road again. So, like, I walked in the house and I, like, told Kayla, like, literally, like, it was, like, one of the first things that I, that I, like, told her. And I was, like, here. I was, like, you can read all the text messages. You can go through the phone. Because I was, like, this is ridiculous. And I'm not going down this road again. Like, hard pass. Wow. So, it was insane. So, d that is. And that's super inappropriate, too. Like, in, in the in the workplace and stuff. But did you have a minute of feeling like you used to when that would happen or did, were you like immediately like oh hell no like I had a feeling in the moment of like if I wanted to I could manipulate whatever I wanted out of this like there so was a you moment were aware. there was a moment of realization that like right now like this person this person is saying this this person is claiming has claimed to be a Christian and like wouldn't cross these moral boundaries but here they are admitting which to me that's already like a green light saying like okay if they're gonna admit that like I can pretty much get them to do whatever they want whatever I want and then and then right after that you were like hell no yeah well I mean this. 
obviously it does it does really help that I'm not attracted to her. I mean that's obviously a big one too. Mm. But like moral of the story is like I was like hell no because I was like this is not like I've been down this road. I've been down this road like five times. Like we're not doing this, and this is something that I've like decided that I'm going to change and it's going to be different. And like I was just. I don't know. I was just like blown away because I was not expecting that, and I was like, literally, I like, I like, I like told Kayla, I was like, like, I just, I just like let it go. I was just like, what the hell is going on? Like, why? I was like, I'm not, I'm not interacting with this person like inappropriately. I'm not even like talking to them that much at work. I'm not flirting, like all this kind of stuff. And I was just like, what the heck is going on? I was like, this is ridiculous. And I was just like, I don't know. It just like blew me away. But like. My my therapist asked me, like, because I told her, I got, like, halfway through, and I was like, oh, I forgot to tell you this. And I, like, told her the whole story. She was like, that's crazy. And then she was like, like, has it, like, messed with your head at all? And I was like, I sat there, and I was like, mm-hmm. I was like, probably about 5%. I was like, 5%. Like, mm-hmm. I know, and I know that it's, like, messed with my head of, like, okay, like, this, like, and not even being, like, attracted to the person, but, like, knowing that power and control of, like, hey, I can manipulate this however I want kind of a thing. And just like Mm -hmm. realizing, realizing in the moment, like how easy it is, how easy it is to go back that direction, how it easy is with people that, you know, you don't even like or how easy it is with people that, I don't know. It was just, it was crazy. It was crazy. Wow. Well, it sounds like you handled it really well. And I'm so glad that you like were honest with your wife. Yeah, that was, like, the one thing, like, whenever, whenever, it's, like, the biggest red flag was, like, hey, you can delete this before you get home, and I was, like, heck no, like, I'm a pro at deleting stuff before I get home, and I'm not going back down that road again, like, I mean, I was really good at hiding stuff, I was really good at, like, doing everything inappropriate and not getting caught, and, like, having someone, like, say that to me, I was just, like, red flag, like, this is not what I'm going back down, I've been down that hole, and I don't want to go back down to that pit again because that's what it was it was a pit I'm so glad I'm so so it almost sounds like you've been like I've made this decision and no no nothing no one's going to take that away from me like you're not going to allow that or you're not going to go back on your promise to yourself and and your wife and and that's that's I mean that's awesome yeah because it's more or less it's it's so, more a promise like to myself it's more or less like a promise mm-hmm. of like this is where I'm at. This is what I'm not going to do or cross anymore. And like, I've got like many different reasons why it's not just like one particular thing, but like in reality, like what it comes down to is it's not, it's not because of Kayla. Like it's not because of Mm -hmm. necessarily something external. It's because of what I've decided or what I've gone through or what the experiences that I've had that have brought me to the place that I'm like, no, this is how it's going to be. Because if it's just based on someone else, if it's just based on Kayla, then, then it odds work. are it would only last probably like three months. Right. And then you would be find a way to be able to blame her, right? right. Like for, yeah, no, if it's not for you, I, I kind of think that goes for all of us in different ways, though. Like if the therapy isn't for us and it's not focused on us becoming healed and better people, then, you know, it has to be for us. Mm-hmm. Um Gosh, Sarah Jessica, I feel like I need to message you later. I'm sorry, I'll, what's happened with that today? That's that's insane. Yeah, I did a video on that. I don't know if you saw it, Jane L, but I did a video on um, how narcissists will like try to blame me, blame you for their affairs. It's they all do the same thing. Yeah. It's not your fault. I've done that. Yeah. It's just a way to get out of response, uh, out of taking accountability. And if, right, if you can try to convince the betrayed partner that if they were only better, then you have an opportunity for them to try to do more for you. And then you don't have to do any changing or hold yourself accountable or I'm not saying you, I'm saying in general, I think that's what a lot of us have been through with them. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I was catching up on comments. Lee was commenting on the No, comments. you're fine. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that was that was my crazy experience this past week. I was just like, what the hell is going on? Yikes. 
That's so uncomfortable. Yeah. I don't, I'm, it's inappropriate. And it was weird too, because this person has like interacted with like me and also like met my wife too. Like that's, that's the part that's just like, it's just, it's just weird. I don't know. I almost wonder if she's, I mean, she doesn't sound very stable. No. She has a husband and kids. She's met your wife. I mean, the, yeah. Yeah. She's, she's a walking red flag. It was, it was crazy. So, but yeah, that was, uh, that was a good topic to talk to therapy. Cause I was like, yeah. When you, when you messaged me that, uh, I was like, Oh boy, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something it just, happened. It was just like wild. And I was like, this does not make sense. And like, seeing all the red flags and like uh hearing and like feeling like the red flags too of like okay like here's a door it's cracked i can like open it up and step through it or i can close it you know and that's just like the the crazy thing is just like looking at it and like realizing like how much like manipulation and control like has gone on but how much like goes on and is like potential to go on like on a day-to-day basis it's like it's like a mind battle, you know, it's a, a battle of the mm-hmm. mind, a, a war in your head at times of like, okay, I'm not going to think that way. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to go that direction. Like, yeah. Good. I'm so glad. Thank you, Mr. Corey. <laughs> um, so, okay. Yeah. All right. So Nicole Lynn and Ginger are talking and they're saying that like, Her narcissist bragged at how well he could fake an apology and seem empathetic. Mm -hmm. You just remember, before I let Ben take that over, you just reminded me of something. Um, I I think I did a video on this, but he, when he was like in NA or whatever, they gave, they have these little cards with like quotes on it. And on the back of it, he wrote, when I'm the king of manipulation, I trust no one. And one day he brings it down and shows it to me, like right after we got married, I was like, um... This doesn't make me feel like I was like, oh, shit, like, you know, like this. I'm like, why are you showing me this? It doesn't make me feel very good about being married to somebody who is saying that you're because he would say I I can I can manipulate the F out of anybody. And he shows me this card. And I think, you know, with with him, he's more of a sociopath. So I think he um, got a kick out of revealing little things to me to make me worry and to ruminate. Um, but they it definitely like are able like proud to make of it. Like you wanted to show, show it off yeah. to you too. Yeah, I yeah. know. I know you would not like him. I, I'm telling you, nobody does really. But, right. Um, no, he, um, yeah, but they can't like, they, that's the thing you, you, you oh, narcissists are great actors and mimickers, right? That's a, what a lot of narcissists. That's how they get their personality is by mimicking other people. It's how they, put their personality together so they know what a sincere apology looks like right you know if they've seen it before but they don't know how it feels or or they own they don't do it to improve the relationship they're doing it to get their way yeah yeah or right or get a response yeah Mm -hmm. very much very true like and i i think i think especially like how you mentioned like about like sociopath and like stuff like that i think like one of the things is like maybe you mentioned a video or lee mentioned a video of like like i know i know people talked about like the the like levels of narcissism and like you know how it moves yeah the spectrum and like really like you know when i think about it and when like i go through day to day like on different things like there's different like thoughts or ideas or notions or whatever that pop into my head that i'm like you know me at my unhealthiest is obviously like extremely narcissistic but like me at my unhealthiness that would stay in that state i could definitely see becoming sociopathic like just yeah. like the tendency and the drift of like how that mind works and how like those thoughts progress is very like when you start realizing like hey this this thought just popped in my head like okay like where did that come from okay if i go down that train of thought like that is continuing to pr- degress into the pit degress into like sociopathic like thought style which is it's crazy and i think too like and i you know i i can research i mean i've done so much research on this but 
like the, a little bit of a difference with the sociopath too is like the planning and the intent right so they go up they go beyond the like responding with a lie or reacting with a lie or covering their tracks or whatever Mm -hmm. after the fact they like plan things to be cruel like it's so they they are still impulsive and they still have the, all all the narc traits but it's just that that next step up right. i think of um planning like yeah. planning to take your keys so you can't get to work planning he literally was whispering i thought i was dreaming it that he was um he had changed my he was in my room we were already like in separate bedrooms and he was whispering and saying that he was had changed the password of my phone so that I couldn't work with my clients. And he was and I woke up and he's standing like right here, like staring at me. So I'm like, oh, my God, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I just wanted to say goodbye. I was like, mm, that's not because I mean, I was deep in my ex strategy at this point, but we right. were in separate bedrooms. So like you wake up and some psycho is like this close to your face, right? Right. right. Go, and so I was like, wow, I, I was just like, that was weird. And I'm like, God, that, that I, but I'm kind of glad he woke me up because it was such a nightmare. Woke up and I couldn't get into my phone. And I had to, and I had clients all day long. It's like he, my business, you know, I'm a career coach too. And mm -hmm. my business is going really well. And he was furious probably about that because I was succeeding, even though he was benefiting by spending all the money. Right. Um, but that jealousy was there when I mm -hmm. took the phone in, I asked them like, how is it possible for this to happen? Like, I know, I, I still know what my little design was to open right. my phone. And they're like, this only ever happens. Like when kids prank each other or in domestic violence situations. And I was like, hmm, there That's we go. Crazy. But he had to plan that out. You know what I mean? Right. That's not so, you know, for, oh, Oh, I'm not sure who they, yeah. Yeah, I would say, like, depending Highly on, organized. like, what level of the spectrum, like, they are, narcissistic or sociopath, there's times that they're, like, very, very observant um, because they mm -hmm. never they never know what knowledge might help them leverage power over somebody, you know? And just, like, you know, like, I think I think you have like someone who's wants to to wield that power and then you also have other people like other either sociopaths or narcissists that would would use that information more as like a covert control of like okay now I can access your phone and know everything that's going on in your life and you have no clue that I have I know that mm -hmm. you know? Um, mm -hmm. because like I guess like from so from like my side, from like an unhealthy state, like that's slightly more power because you don't know that that power is over you. So it's like in your back pocket. Mm -hmm. Wow. And like you. Sorry, I'm getting. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Like you, you can, you can learn and you can know like so much about another person by like what they do or how they act or like the music they listen to or like the Instagram posts that they like or like different things like that. And so like when you start like observing and understanding, it gives you a, a framework to start building whatever reality you want around that other person. So the fact that like, if they don't know that you have access or if they don't know, like, you know, what's going on, like in your head, like that's the prime opportunity for a narcissist to start love bombing and gaslighting and you know all this kind of stuff because if they have access if they understand if you open up like a lot of different ways like that provides like the ideal way to create a perfect scenario for you um mm. until you're hooked and then after that the excitement of hooking you is over and what's next it's um it's interesting because I, I did, I've mentioned this in some videos, but my therapist was like, block him on social media. Mm -hmm. She said, like, block him. And I'm like, are you allowed to do that when you're married? Like, even though I was almost, you know, almost ready to file. Um, right. Well, I think it was a few months before. No, it might have been a whole year before. I don't know. I can't remember now. But she's like, block him. She's like, if he's using social media to stalk you and harass you, and he's using, you know, he's also using it because he would go and like all of our mutual friends stuff, but he would never respond to mine. And, you know, I've got a, I've, I've got like 4,500 Facebook friends. So I've got a really big network right. and he would get so jealous. Cause like one of his posts would get like two likes and I would have like 300, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, so she's like, block him. And I'm like, 
Oh, okay. So I blocked him on everything. I only left text messages open, but then I found out that email was better for court stuff. So I switched to the email and I blocked him from texting me because he would harass me all day, Yeah. like just swearing, calling me names, threatening me all day long. Thank you, BK. I love having you here. Thank you so much. Um, and I think it made him lose his shit. Like, I know he has fake accounts, you know, I'm sure. I'm sure he follows, still tries follow, follows my Facebook and stuff on a fake account. But the fact that I did that and took all that away from him, and he was like, you can't, you know, what if there's an emergency? I'm like, I'll see your email notification if there's an emergency. That's Right. that's Mm what, what if, what if? -hmm. My Yeah. daughter is already an adult, you know, you're, you're her, his kid is in trouble all the time, but he was 18 or 17 and, um, his daughter was an adult. So whatever. Right. And I, and I know like it just grinded at him that, that I did that, that I took that away from him, which made me realize how much he was doing it, like how much he was doing just what you said. Cause it's not just like, I don't think, I think sometimes people think that's just in the beginning, But that happens all the way through the relationship with the narcissist. They're, that doesn't stop for a lot of them. It's They'll an addiction. stalk you while you're married to them. Yeah, Hmm? it's an addiction. It's an addiction. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, okay. I didn't think of it that way. Yeah. I would definitely say that. Like, like I mean, I, so like the one, so the, the girl that I was with that has like BPD, like that still is a struggle sometimes to not want to go in, unblock her, look at her story, look at her posts and then reblock her just so I can see like what's going on, even though I know, and I have no desire to go back to her. Like, there's just that, I don't know what it is. It's just like something in my head. So like, you know, you get, you get to a place where you're not in a good headspace. You're like, okay, maybe I'll look up this person and like, see what's going on, you know, but it just like, is there, it's like a, I wouldn't say a constant thing, but it's a thing that's like there that like is easy to like struggle with. And honestly, like there's a, there's a point of time where like Kayla and I were going through a rough time. I mean, she, she left for a period of time. And, and part of it, like, she, she talked to me and she was like, honestly, I think there is a good part. Like, even if she said like a while back, she was like, even if like, we don't work out, she's like, I think that there was a part of me that God had me stay with you for the first little bit, just so that you wouldn't be stuck with her. Like the other girl that had BPD Wow. because like realizing and like me realizing, like she saw it a lot earlier than I did, but like realizing and seeing more of it pop out of just like, how toxic it was and how manipulative it was on that side. She was like, like you would have like, you would have like lost it because you would have been an awful person with her. And it's true, you know? Yeah. So Lee is saying that he uses, he used to check in to make sure that he was doing better. Yeah. <laughs> you Yeah, Lee, Lee's got uh, so. it more from the side that he wants to be, he wants to prove them wrong, prove them better, like, I was more on the side of like, you know, I'd rather like, you know, stalk them or figure out like, you know, do they still think of me? Do they miss me? Or like, you know, um, or like, like, where are they at with life? Or like, sometimes it's just that addiction of like, you know, this is the, this is the drug I've been drinking from for so long. Like, I, I want to go back to it. I want to see like, how it's doing, you know, different things like that. So I wanted to say something um, on this. I pretty, yeah, Savage Impact did a video on this. She's pretty straightforward about it, which I appreciate. I think you get to a certain point in the, the traumatic healing journey that you do need to hear some tough love, and she's really good at it, and she's fun. But they're not obsessed. So basically her message was, and you can correct me if I'm not saying this the right way, but basically the message is they're not obsessed with you. They're moving on to other supply, right? And I think that's important to understand that the way we would think of obsession, like on the other side, is that they still want to love us. They still want to be with us. They still want to, they want to um, come, ha come back to us, you know, and, and, and all that. And that is not what it is. Um, at all. Like, it's not so like, if you're getting love bombed, don't do not do not resume contact. If you find them on your social media somehow, or like in Venmo or something, you have to block them because it's not 
it's not the way a healthy relationship where people break up, work on themselves a little bit, maybe want to try it again mm -hmm. situation. That's not what this is. So, um, Nicole Lynn, I'm so glad you're here too. So thank you for being here. Yeah. All narcs are different. Latest mama is saying so, um, yeah, we have to kind of remember that even though they, it sounds like they all have that same script or playbook that they still are individuals and might have different motivations and they're on different places in the spectrum too. So. Oh, uh, gotcha. Someone's, someone's trying to understand why I would want to look at her page. Uh, I feel like I don't have a good answer. Um, well, you said, you said I mean, because it's an addiction. It literally right? is. Like, or... like, like, literally, like, um, like, literally there was, I don't know, like, three months ago or something like that. So, like, we had, like, an account also on, like, Marco Polo for a period of time. And so, like, she hadn't blocked me on it. So, like, I went on to Marco Polo and, like, opened it up and I could see, like, previous videos and, like, how I was feeling or whatever. I was, like, Okay, so like I literally like recorded like a second of the floor and then like deleted it and she got a notification that I like was recording something to her or whatever. And like I'm just like, why did I do that? Like that was so stupid. I don't want that. I don't need this person in my life. But like it was almost I don't want to say like compulsion, but like it kind of feels more like compulsion of like like somehow like wanting to have some form of contact even though you know it's not healthy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I don't know who said it. And thank you for everybody who's modding and helping answer questions. That's, that's so awesome. Um, but somebody was saying that they feel guilty about still loving the narcissist and, you know, it's a very painful kind of situation. I just happened to go through all of mine on the inside of the marriage, but sometimes people go through it on the other side, mm -hmm. um, or toward the end. Um, but like, you so what the narcissist will do is they will find every single quality in you that they admire right and they will pull all of that out they're they're watching they're very observant like ben was just saying and then they will turn around and be a reflection of you so they will pretend they have high levels of integrity they will pretend that they, um, you know, are upbeat and positive or whatever your personality type is. They'll even pretend to like the same music as you do. And it's like, you know, oh, my God, like I found my person. That's yeah. just that's just what they you'll find out who that person is pretty soon. And it's not it's not who they reflected back at you or they pulled like the best pieces of other people's personalities to impress you. So you fell in love with who they pretended to be, which is someone very much like you. So when you leave them, I think part of it is that a lot of us who are empathic also like have this sort of maternal or paternal instinct where we want to take care of people and things like that. It almost makes you feel like, how are they going to make it without me? You know, if I leave them, uh, what will happen to them? You know, and, and you I'll think back them. to the beginning or the, yeah, or the, like the love bombing that mm -hmm. ha happens repeatedly through the relationship and you hang on to those times until you really see it. Once you see it, you, you won't feel like that anymore. But I think a lot of us can relate to that. It's hard to come Sorry. to that reality yeah. because it feels like I would imagine from the empath side, it feels like you're having to like sacrifice some of yourself to actually admit that there could have been something majorly wrong the entire time. And that reality is hard to swallow. Oh, right. And then people will feel like, like I felt like, Jesus, I wasted nine years of my life, mm -hmm. you know, um, but I don't look at it like that anymore. I, I look at that as thank you, Rain Mom. <laughs> I look at it like, you know, I had to go through that to get to where I am now. And I remember telling my therapist, you know, the, the reality is if it wasn't him, it would have just been another one just like him. Cause I've only been in narcissistic relationships and she's like, you're right until you, you know, maybe, you know, this, this guy as terrible as he was as abusive as he was, got you to the point that you healed the trauma that you needed to heal. And now, you know, cause it's true. If, if we don't fix ourselves and become our own, you know, I always say become your own best friend until you do that, you'll keep going back to what's familiar. And right. it's just cause it's familiar, you know? Thank you, gals. Yeah. 
So do you have questions on your side? Um, yeah, someone just asked a good one. Is there anything I can do to de-escalate? So it's a really good one. It's a, it's a tough one too, because the, the more and more I hear and I talk to other, talk, talk to different people, the more you see like consistency with narcissists, but also like such variety. Like I know that sounds like talking out both sides of my mouth, but like you have like the consistent things that narcissists do, but then you have people that, you know, respond completely different. Like, it's not like you say like the color blue and they always respond this way. You can say the color blue and they respond six different ways, depending on what type of a narcissist they are or how they interact. So like, it's hard to be able to give you a, you know, one answer that says like, Hey, do one, two, three, and you'll have them deescalate. You know, um, a lot of it depends mm -hmm. on like their type of triggers, like, like how much rage they have, how much interaction they have, how much blame shifting, gaslighting, different things like that. And I, I, I do say like, it would be interesting. I haven't had obviously the time to do this, but I think it'd be interesting to actually like go through and study like different types as far as like, you know, ones that, you know, their immediate response is like rage or their immediate response is gaslighting or immediate response is blame shifting or whatever it might be. There's, I would imagine, I don't know for sure, but I would imagine there's probably something out there that like, if it's rage, that there might be one type of scenario that could slightly deescalate that. And if it's like gaslighting, that that same response wouldn't deescalate, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But again, with all different types of people, I doubt that it's, that I, doubt, I know there's not one answer to be able to fix that for sure. Um, thank you, Brandy Lou sent us 50 roses. <laughs> <laughs> She's so cute. <laughs> thank you. Um, I know with mine, it's interesting that you say that you just made me think of something. I would try every strategy. Mm -hmm. I tried not saying anything. I tried calmly talking. I tried um, yelling back. I tried leaving the room. I tried the little cards of communication cards that the therapist gave us. And then he would just mimic me as I was, there are these series of questions that you're supposed to prompt a good, great conversation. Oh, somebody just gave me, was that glasses? <laughs> <laughs> um, and he would, he turned that into, you know, um, like, oh, I see. So according to you, you feel, Brandy Lou kind of reminds me of your ex sometimes. So there was nothing. I tried making a nice dinner. He would say, chili, what about spaghetti? Like there was, right. there was nothing, Always nothing. And finally, I just checked out, like, whatever, I don't care. Mm -hmm. And this, and like, again, he's more of a sociopath. So he would follow me all around the house. I couldn't go into a room that he wouldn't come into and keep screaming. If I went outside, he'd go outside and he'd like grab my arm and like scream, whisper in my ear. If I tried to get in the car, he'd try to get my keys first. So mm -hmm. that's why I had a go bag and stuff like that, because there was just no deescalating him in any way. There was nothing that could be done mm -hmm. unless I tried to, to videotape, unless I tried to videotape, tried to video him. If he thought I was, which I was pretty much doing 24 seven for the last few months um, for the PPO and stuff. But like right. he, the only thing that would deescalate him is if um, he got a phone call or if a neighbor came over or something. And all of a sudden he was like, Hey, how you doing? Mm -hmm. You know, that's it. Otherwise he just had to either get high and drunk enough to pass out or. Right. So snowy, sorry. I missed, I missed your question earlier. I didn't respond to it, but I would definitely say a sociopath is worse than a narcissist, but they both have really toxic tendencies and traits oh um, for sure a sociopath a lot of times is going to be a little bit more you're going to see it a little bit more and like like how heather's talking and their like manipulation and actual like a physical abuse control like things like that a narcissist a lot of times is going to be a lot more tricky sneaky um manipulative but like underneath the scenes mm -hmm. so like they they both i wouldn't downplay either one and say one is you know, better than the other or worse than the other. I think sociopath would be worse than the other, but at times, you know, there's people that have made arguments that like physical abuse and emotional abuse, like, which is worse, like they're both bad, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. It's not like, it's not like, um, you know, Oh great. They're cluster B, you know, like yeah. which one's better. <laughs> they're right. all terrible. Right. <laughs> Sorry. No familiar. offense. I'm talking about the unaware, the ones who won't get help. No, no, I, I hear you. Uh, so this, uh, Snowy's, uh, therapist thinks that he's a sociopath, sociopath. So more than just a narcissist. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, whenever you talked about like the spectrum, like you have like your narcissist, like self aware all the way to like toxic, and then from there it progresses into like the sociopath range. Yeah. And then psychopath, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sociopath and then psychopath. What would be like the main distinctive between those two? I'm curious. So. Um, between, so like the, the sociopaths are more like your serial killer types, mm -hmm. you know, like they, they go like, a, a, I mean, they go, they just have zero, zero <laughs> they just like right. so where a sociopath might not might think they're above the law they still won't take it all the way in a lot of cases mm -hmm. where a psychopath just will those mm -hmm. are the people who will like just walk by an escalator and just push somebody down it you know stuff like that mm -hmm. um i can i can um i can look stuff up on that again i know it i just can't remember all the all right. the different characteristics no, that makes and sense. do a video Yeah. Yeah, Snowy, just be careful, set boundaries, try to make sure that, you know, you're having good boundaries as far as, you know, him being in your life, especially with having a kid, you know, you don't want anything to happen, you have to be careful of what's going on. I don't know your whole situation, mm -hmm. but that's definitely, definitely a part that can be hard, especially when you have, you know, someone that has rage and different things like that, you have to be careful, protect yourself too. I mean, honestly, the best thing that I ever did for myself was get to that point of um, just observing rather than absorbing it. And, you know, I say it all the time, but honestly, responding rather than reacting changed everything. It escalated his behavior, right, because he wasn't getting the supply he wanted from me. Um, but I did, I think, I'm pretty sure he was cheating at the end, which was great because he was out of the house a little more. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Right. Either that or he's going to his mom's and dad's. But like, I just, you know, so he he's more mad because he's not getting supply from me. But you know that, you know, that we do not care. That's exactly how I felt. I was like, we do not care. I have heard you scream and yell and stomp and, and swear and, you know, throw things around so long that I'm just putting my headphones in and he would just sit there. I have an a, a audio recording of him while I'm listening to the little shaman who's talking about narcissistic rage, mm -hmm. like with these in, and he's raging at me while I'm listening to this <laughs> YouTube video about narcissistic rage. And I have the whole thing audio and, you know, I just turned, kept turning the volume up and he just raged. And then he wore him, he wore his little self out and then he left the room <laughs> finally. <Right. laughs> so it's not funny. It's just kind of dark humor. But like when you get to the point where you just don't care what they say, cause you know, it's all bullshit anyway. And projection it's, that's the start of you, like getting your power back and getting out. Mm -hmm. Cause again, once you see it, you won't unsee it, you know? Yeah, that's very true. My side is pretty quiet as far as questions. Oh, there we go. Do narcs ever feel fully satisfied with their partner? Can't understand the constant need for more. Yeah, I would say especially with supply, like they're typically not satisfied with supply because they're always trying to look for you know, what's bigger, what's better, what's the next thing, what's the next boundary to break, what's the next high to have. And um, whenever we were on Lee's um, live the other week, like, I feel mm -hmm. like we talked a little bit about this as far as, like, not feeling fully satisfied and having to start looking in the moment of, like, how do you have, how do you develop, like, gratitude and joy, like, where you are currently in life? Because otherwise, you're right. never going to be satisfied. And you're going to keep, you know, looking for the next best thing, the next the next high, the next relationship, the next emotion, like whatever it might be versus like trying to learn and figure out how can I be, you know, my best self now, how can I be content with what I have now? And typically a narcissist isn't ever content with that. Um, well, the external validation, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that external validation takes place of all of that other stuff. Yeah. Cause healthy people don't want, they don't want like other people in their you know what I mean? I don't, I don't want anything to come between me and my partner, right. you know? Um, so I would never allow it. Right. Like it's, it's not, but when you're looking, when you're seeking that external validation all the time, then I, I would imagine that takes up enough of your time and your thoughts 
and it's giving you that high, like you're saying that you don't have time to even think about looking at yourself, right? Right. Well, most narcs wouldn't want to look at themselves either, you know, like that, that's Is not that part a, of it then? that's not a pleasant thing to, to look at and think of. So you don't, so you move on to the next thing. It's really helpful. Haley said, do people that are not narcissists, do non-narcissists love bomb? I mean, I'd probably say like, yes at times, but like, I would say that's typically a, a bigger characteristics for the narcissist in terms of love bombing is to get a result. Yeah, that's wait, say that again. That was really good. You might want to do video on that. Um, <laughs> I'm just suggesting. <laughs> yeah, so like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I would say that narcissists love bomb to get a result. So like, you might have someone else that's not a narcissist actually show like love bombing traits in one sense, but I feel like a lot of times that's more innocent per se, or, or if you, I guess we could just define love bombing. If we define love bombing as love bombing is excess love and admiration to get a desired result, then you're back at manipulation. Mm. And yeah, you are going to have people that aren't narcissists that do manipulate people. Um, but typically like when you have love bombing, it is linked to narcissists and narcissists that love bomb are for the reason of manipulating. So Whitney is agreeing with you on, um, do you and Whitney follow each other? Whitney Cordell? I think so. Thanks, Brandy Lou. If um, not, she needs to jump over great, here and but... follow me and I'll follow her back. But... Oh, you see, you see what he's doing? Up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Whitney, go, go jump over on Ben's for a sec if you I want think, him to does. follow him. Okay. But she's saying she thinks unhealed love, unhealed people love bomb, but they're not narcissists. And I think that that might be one of those like flea narcissistic flea situations where mm -hmm. you yeah. think you have to go above and beyond um, in order to get love. You will stop doing that when you heal your trauma and you put yourself first. Okay, yeah. Like my partner came over this morning and I, I surprised him with like a kind of ex not expensive, but a pricier um, breakfast this morning because I had been wanting him to try this place that has these huge omelets. And my only purpose is just because I love him. I just want him, I, we haven't seen each other in a few days. So that was it. Right. <laughs> like I wasn't looking for anything else, you know, but, but I do think it's a good question. Mm -hmm. Cause I, I think that's right. I think when you're unhealed, maybe the, the desired result based on how you're explaining it is to get somebody to keep loving you. You know, like if I do this, this person won't leave me kind of thing. Um, but it's not the same right. as love bombing. Yeah, I think, yeah, we feel good I think in that aspect, good, yeah. it would probably fall into the lines of like, um, like people pleasers or um, mm -hmm. uh, like people like afraid of con conflict. So I think like I could see some of that falling under like on the Enneagram, like Enneagram nines, like people that you know, are afraid of conflict and they'd rather do anything possible to be able to avoid conflict. So as a result, like some of that could end up being like love bombing, if that means it gets them out of some a conflict, you know, relationship interaction and things like that. So, yes, Whitney, it's I, not I as exciting on this side. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 not as much as going on on this side. So, um, I took, um, good. Oh, I was going to tell you real quick. I've got, I have to take it again because I'm not positive, but it might be right. I took the Enne uh, an Enneagram um, earlier today because I wanted to, I think I screenshot, I was going to send you my results and I forgot to do it. Yeah. Um, okay. And I showed up as an Enneagram eight really? and I thought for sure I would be a nine, but I think that my healing and a lot of the stuff that has changed about me is I just don't accept stuff that I used to anymore. Mm -hmm. I was just sort of surprised by that. So I want to take it one more time just to make sure. What, um, it would make what sense website to me. did you use? I'll send you the screenshot. It was like a six or seven page, like online. Um, they, I mean, I didn't pay for the full report. I was just yeah, curious yeah. to see if where I fell. But like where it says, I care, I, I care something like I care extensively about how people think about me. I'm like, not really <laughs> like, where before I would, you know, so it was just interesting. Um, yeah. That's I'll send it I to you. I wouldn't peg you for an eight, to be honest. I'm like pulling up. I know. I'm that's why I want to take it again. It. Um, let me see here. 
me see if I can find it. Give me a second. What did, um, hey, Blaze. Oh, thanks. Um, wait, I missed a question earlier. Oh, yeah. Do narcs, do narcs reminisce fondly about the past? Hmm. That's an interesting one. Um, I'm going to try to pull up this thing real quick. I found it the other day. I have it saved someplace, but I couldn't find it. Okay. Yeah, I can send it to you, too. Oh, you're pulling up yours. Yeah, I'm pulling up mine. I don't really think narcs look... Yeah, BK, I'm an ENFJ on Myers-Briggs, so we're, we're right there. We're close. Um, I don't think narcs look back fondly like that way because they hate you when you leave them or when you won't like you know take them back or whatever they don't they they will look at you and I have a video I do have one of my drafts on this but they will look at you and literally say I will destroy you if you try to leave me mm -hmm. I will um the gloves gloves are off you know and because you left them and especially if you block them and you you know you you don't, they have no chance to see you or if you're using our family wizard you won't communicate with them any other way they're freaking angry yeah. so i i yeah, yeah yeah like it's not like when you when you leave a healthy relationship you're like you know that person was really good for me we just weren't right together but i remember we did this and that was fun it's not like that um yeah because you want you can expand on this you, you said betrayal yeah like uh, a lot of times like that's a big like cutoff point um i think someone i don't remember who i think someone like stitched me like asking like how to become like you know, their arch enemy. And so they'll actually leave you alone. And like the closest way of that is like when the narc actually feels like completely and utterly like betrayed to the point of like, mm -hmm. okay, I can't go back there anymore. I'm not going to do that. And some people like equate that to humiliation, but it's not the same. Like, uh, like if you try to humiliate a narc, like it's com humil humiliation is different than betrayal. And I think a lot of times people equate thinking like, oh, if I humiliate my narc, like, no, like, you're just going to piss them off and then they will come back and destroy you because, like, that's just the trigger in their mind. But if they actually feel like there's some – I can't think of a good example off the top of my head, but if they actually think there's, like, some point that you actually betrayed them, like, a lot of times that's where there is, like, that disconnect of, like, okay, that door is closed. Like, let me go some other someplace else. Mm-hmm. I was going to respond to someone and I lost it. Um Um, so um, whenever so whenever you go um, to to do the Enneagram, pull up and look for and look at it's called your Enneagram coach dot com. And okay. and try try that, Take one. that one. Yeah. And when you get done, it'll like ha it'll show your results. And when you like scroll down to the bottom, it'll show you like a, a bunch of like graphs. It'll show you like a graph for each one and show you like where you rank as far as like highest one. Screenshot that and send that to me. Um I, I love the Enneagram stuff, um, for sure. What do you think I am? <laughs> What's interesting about Enneagram is typically Enneagram does not change. Like normally, like once, like if you if you develop and say you're an Enneagram like three like you're not typically going to change to a completely different Enneagram. You're pretty much always going to be like that same one. You might, you know, head closer to a, like a, a different wing. So you might wing mm -hmm. to a, if you're a three, you might wing to a two or a four, like more heavily if you have like some type of trauma or things like that. Um, I'll tell you, I would guess you're more of a nine wing eight personally. That's what I'm wondering if, 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 because I, the people pleasing behaviors are largely gone, if that's what shifted me over, I think but I'll, I'll what take I would, that one. what I would conjecture would be you, you were more of a nine, grew up more of a nine. And because of the trauma that you went through, it pulled out more of your inner wing, which is, you know, not wanting no, so like the fear of an of a of a eight is being weak, powerless, controlled, harmed, and at the mercy of injustice, and so like like that feeling probably became a lot more prevalent after going through a relationship with a sociopath. I see. Interesting. So like, I love this stuff. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm so excited. I'm I hope you all do it too. So you said it's your enneagramcoach.com. Yeah.
It's um, it's a it's okay. a pretty good one. It's it's really simple, but like it's it's laid out really good. I love that. I love that stuff. So like, think of think of it this way. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot. I'm gonna ask you. I'm gonna ask you questions now. Um, all right. So Ugh. think of it. Think of it this way. So I just I just told you the eight one. So an eight mm -hmm. an eight's core fears. So an engram eight's core fear is being weak, powerless, controlled, harmed, and at the mercy of injustice. A nine's mm -hmm. core fear is being in conflict, loveless, separate, overlooked, shut out, or in discord with others. I used to feel like that. Now I don't as much. I just don't. It's really strange, but I, I just, I, you know, I, I, I've realized that I've had a lot of people in my life. I have a lot of amazing people in my life, but I've had mm -hmm. a few that are quite toxic as even just meaning like friends, like girlfriends and stuff that I don't, that I have cut out during the pandemic. I, I don't know. Okay, it's so here's, just here's not, question two. I told okay. you I'm gonna put you on the spot. All right, so here's question two. Okay. Tell me, tell me which sounds, tell me which connects more with you. Okay, this would be uh, your like a core desire. Okay, tell me which connects more with you. Um, to have inner stability and peace of mind, or mm -hmm. to protect themselves and those in their inner circle. First one. Okay. Next question. <laughs> Okay. What? <laughs> what would be? No, I, I don't care. I love this stuff. What would what would be more of a? What would you identify more as being a core longing? You will not be betrayed, or your presence matters. Sorry, could you read the part of the question again? Yeah. So, like, basically, this is trying to say, like, this you would identify the most with as being like one of like your core longings. Okay. So longings. it would okay. be. So your longing would be the concept of you will not be betrayed or your presence matters? Um, I mean, I guess I feel like if I'm going, see, this is where I'm so different now. Like if somebody's going to betray me, I'm like, okay, then you don't belong in my life next. Right. Because it opens up so much room for awesome people. So I guess the other one then, I guess my presence matters. Okay. Um, all right, so then last question. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> So this, this is the more vulnerable one. So core weakness. Okay. Mm -hmm. So core weakness, the two, the two that are in question here is one, the core weakness is sloth. And the other one, core weakness is lust. Sloth meaning like messy, dirty. Um, I would think more of like, um, like when you're, so like weakness, so like say like you're struggling, say like something's going on like sloth wise as far as like maybe like the messy stuff, but I would say more of like the lethargic, like don't want to do things, things like that. Okay, so that or lust is, is what I... Yeah, is the two options. And what was the question again? Yeah, uh, like core core weakness. Probably sloth then. Yeah, so that would put you as a nine wing eight. Look at, wow, wow, yeah. you were spot on. Okay, yeah. I like it though. I like that wing eight, I, I like that I have that wing eight in me now. Like it was probably always there, but I just wasn't allowed to use it or something, you know, growing you up in such an abusive home. I would say you wing stronger going through the trauma that you went through, which just means that you're at the place more that you're gonna stand up for other people. So you're going to stand up for that mm -hmm. injustice because you experienced it and you're also not going to deal mm -hmm. with as much BS. And so you've got the place where you're going to cut people out of your life. But I would, I would imagine probably like early on in your life. So like say teens and twenties that you probably didn't have that mindset of like no BS and cutting people out of your life. You'd rather just have include everybody. Oh yeah. That, and that's how you end up, right? right? Like that's how a lot of us end up with these types of people. So that's your nine or these that types you of workplaces. A, more of a stronger wing eight going through that trauma. I love any guns. Interesting. <laughs> it's so much fun. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to go take the whole thing. So he said, it's my Enneagram coach.com. Y'all, if you want to go try yeah. that out. Your Enneagram Or your, sorry, your. Right. Eight is a wing of seven social worker. Oh yeah. I can see that in UBK. So Moody Scuba is asking you, what is a six? What is a six? Um, mm -hmm. So I'll just give off the, the core fears of a six is being without support, guidance, security, and being blamed or abandoned. 
and their core desires is to have security, guidance, and support. Core weakness, anxiety. Core longing for a six is you are safe. My dad's a my dad's a six, I believe, and my mom is a two, and Kayla's a three. Kayla's a three. Yeah, so it's interesting how it all connects. Oh gosh, I have like thirty three new messages. It's (laughs) that's awesome. Now I love Enneagram stuff. Like I have like probably like four books on Enneagram, but I actually have like an Enneagram like textbook. It's literally like that thick, and it goes through every single one, and it is like so spot on it's like creepy it's like crazy i think enneagram is like one of the best i think it's one of the best personality kind of like tests and quizzes because it's not just going off of personality it goes deeper than that it goes to motivation Mm -hmm. like how did you actually get there all this kind of stuff and you can see like you can see like an unhealthy eight has sociopathic tendencies you can see that an unhealthy three um an unhealthy three has like narcissistic tendencies so like the girl that the girl that i was with that had bpd she was enneagram three you know she could like Mm. shape shift and like mold to whatever situation she needed to be to get the desired result Um, wow yeah i'm excited to go to try that try the test that you what's wrong beauty i'm like trying to catch up on comments let's see say hi to the people's Say hi. Doesn't even look like you. There you go. That's it. Someone asked early <laughs> on, how do narcs keep finding new supply? That's a good one. How do narcs keep finding new supply? Um, it's not. It's not like people walk around with a with a flag on their head that says "Come narc me," but once once you have like the mindset of a narc, like you can almost see those people. It's probably it's probably not a very good answer, but like, um, like a, a narc often you don't you don't really find narcissists that prey on like people that are like super strong. Like they might be with those people that are super strong and they want to control and manipulate, and that's where you get a lot of conflict. But like for a narc, like looking for supply, they're normally looking for those people that you know, want to be loved because they're easy to love bomb or like want to have like affection because they're easy to, to control or like manipulate and things like that. Like I wouldn't say that narcs always go for like the weakest link, but they normally go for people that might be vulnerable. Well, right. I mean, and that's, again, that's why, you know, people who are really empathetic, but haven't done the healing work are, you know, are more people pleasers, things like that. It's so much like, right? Like, I swear to God, if my ex being the person I am now, if my ex walked up to me, um, and I didn't know him and asked me out or something, I would be like, ew. (laughs) <laughs> like, honestly, he's just absolutely not like anybody I should have ever been with. Like, you know, but he needed me is how it felt. Right. Like he he needed. Oh, poor guy's been through so much childhood trauma. Well, so have I. Right. Yeah. But like it, it's always like, but I need to help him if it's all the same cliche stuff. You know, he just needs love and things will be great and blah, blah. That type of person is so unattractive to me now. Mm-hmm. Like so unattractive. Right. But that's, you know, you got to heal that stuff. So that's why people think that they're narc magnets, right? But yeah. they, what they fail to realize is that healthy people are attracted to them as well. Healthy people, like, are attracted to other good people. But you are probably more attracted to a narc because of the trauma, codependency issues, you know, people-pleasing issues. Yeah, they prey on people who are vulnerable. You're right, Elise. Yeah. And like it's oh well, it's something MPS that's hard are to, strong and smart. It's hard. It's I'm hard sorry, to I just like wanna, turn off. Yeah, I just wanted to tell Ginger. I totally agree with you. Empaths are strong and smart, and all of those things. But we also, before we realize that about ourselves, we have a tendency to get with people and try to help them and people please and things like that. But no, empaths are badasses. Once you know you, once you know what you you need to know. Sorry, what were you saying? I don't remember. <laughs> um, there's something I don't, I don't remember. I got distracted. I was trying to catch up. Whitney's helping pump my live over here with comments and stuff. So I was trying to catch up on everything. Whitney's awesome. If you can, would you please talk about a 279 tri-type? 
Um, <laughs> this is, there's, this so, is gonna... <laughs> so there, there's not nece- so there's not necessarily a thing as a tri type. So you're going to be one type, and you're going to have wings, and you're going to have, um, you're going to have where you go in growth, and where you go in whatever the word is, not growth. I can't think of the word. Um, but there's not there's not a tri type. You're typically one. You might have one or two wings that are side by side, and then you have um, where you go in growth and where you go. I can't think of the word, not growth. It's the only thing I can think of. Um, let's see, is it a conscious effort for the narc to look for people who fit the supply model or unconscious? Um, I would say at times it's conscious, but a lot of times it's like unconscious. It's just like a, it. After a while, it feels like programming. Like it feels like, oh, like that person looked at me that way. They they probably want me, or like that person looked at me this way. I can interact with them this way to. It is, it's crazy. <laughs> oh, so you're getting things. Sorry, is it our R- R- Risky? Um, she's thanking us keeping this dream go open and keeping communication open. Yeah. So when Ben and I became friends, and then we started chatting. I think I'm losing you for, there you are. Oops. There you are. And we kind of thought, well, let's, you know, we, so we talked about a few months ago, like let's go on a live and stuff. And I wasn't sure like what people were going to think about it at first. And some people have said that it's triggering for them, Mm. but like, I just feel like it's really, it's really good to, to hear from Ben and hear from Lee and, um, you know, get their perspective. And, and, uh, I don't know, it's kind of an interesting combo Right to have to have these like you have the, the former codependent empath and the, <laughs> the right. self aware narcissist. Um, it's 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 helpful to so many people. I think so. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, she's saying it's so or she or he is saying it's so necessary. Day. Have the goal to be helpful and try to bring awareness, growth, change, help. You know. Mm-hmm. Have you ever thought about being a therapist? I'm just curious if that's ever crossed your mind. No, no. I always really. wonder that about Lee too, or a coach, maybe, maybe not a therapist, maybe a coach. I can, I can see like some type of a coach, but I don't, I don't really think a therapist. I don't think I have enough empathy in the moment to be a therapist. I'd be like, just stop doing this and get over the job. No, empathetic therapist. My therapist is a is a tight line as well. Uh, you you said she's pretty much like a badass, right? Like she doesn't put up with any crap from you. Yeah, I think I think she went. She definitely wings eight for sure, but she is a she is Enneagram nine. My my therapist, I, I think Kayla's therapist as well, and the one that we're going to see at the same place that's going to do some couples counseling is all they're all nines, which is kind of kind of interesting. That is interesting. Makes sense though, right? Like probably teachers you know, um, coaches, therapists would fall into that. Yeah, I would think so. Like they want to, they want to be able to, except they're at a place where they're healthy, obviously, because they want to be able to solve the conflict, you know? Mm-hmm. And plus, plus so, I think it's easier for them to try to solve someone else's conflict than it is necessarily for them to be in conflict. I think they still struggle with that but, internally. Mm-hmm. You know? Do you guys want to see how spoiled my dog is? <laughs> This dog, he is the one, like, he is all I wanted after my divorce and get him out of there. So he was only allowed to have bones because um, the ex said that dogs aren't supposed to tear toys up. Pretty sure that's what they're for for most dogs. So I did start buying him toys before I left, but now... Do you think that's too many toys? (laughs) That's just one of his baskets. Here's his puppy pile, I call it. Those are his other toys. <laughs> I'm like, That's I'll buy my dog as many toys as I want to. Right. <laughs> so. <laughs> um. <laughs> Not enough toys. I know. I have a problem. I don't care. He's 10 years old. I want him to be happy for as long as I get to have him, so. I think it'd be interesting sometime to either either do like a dual live or I guess we'd have to do like how we did with Lee where we like invite people in or whatever. But I think it would be kind of I, I think it'd be kind of cool, especially with the Enneagram 
to like have people come on here that don't know anything about the Enneagram or have taken the Enneagram tests and actually like have them come on live for like a couple minutes and like actually like talk through it. Just kind of like how you and I did just a minute ago. Um, Yeah. just because like it, it does give a lot of clarity of like what's going on. Like once you start defining, like, like it's, it's not defining like who you are, but it's like helping you understand, like, this is where I came from. Like, this is Why? how I developed this way. This is, you know, like I've got, I've got one book that like goes through and it, it, it literally says like, if you're this type, this is probably what your childhood looks like. And like nine times out of 10, it's like, okay, that's creepy. Like, how did you know that? You know, because it just, Mm -hmm. it shows like how people develop. Do you think probably the best way to do it would be like you said, how we did where you would allow people to ask to be guests, like have a moderator say like, okay, so-and-so is next. They're going to come in as a guest Yeah, I think that would or be something kind of like cool. that. Like, um, cause Yeah. I thought about that before, especially when we did like the triple live, like, I think that'd be kind of cool where like we could both be on and then have someone like pop in. I've even thought about that for questions. Like, it'd be kind of cool to have someone like pop in for a question, ask it in front of everybody if they want to, if they want to be on video, you know, and then like go back out and kind of, kind of like have people pop in. That'd be so much fun. I feel like that'd also be like a lot Yeah, more for interaction than just not that it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Oops. Wait. Wait, I can't hear you. Sorry. You it got it got really scratchy. What was the question? Do narcissists forget most of their exes? I would say they don't forget a single one or a single thing about them. Negative. Yeah. Lee, Lee says the same thing. They don't Even forget. though he says he just wants to know he's doing better than they are. Yeah, they don't they don't forget or forgive. They just get even or get better. So, okay. Can I add to that? Mm -hmm. I have, um, so I have like two or three therapists at any given time that send me clients. So we sort of do a therapist coach client kind of trifecta sort of thing. Um, because sometimes the therapist sends them to me to help with the actual exit strategy, the inner child work, all that kind of stuff while they're working with them on anxiety, depression, that, that type of thing. But I do know that there's um, not that long ago, one of the therapists had a client who, in spite of all the work they did, ended up taking the narcissist back and got pregnant. And when she was about six months pregnant, the narc took off. Sometimes they just want you back so they can be the ones to leave. And, um, you know, you got to be... it just don't take them back it oh the and the abuse gets worse faster too They want that control. so even though they're always hmm They want that control. They'd rather be the ones like cutting it off than having someone cut them off. yeah right so a lot of times they'll try to get you back you get back with them then they'll turn around and they'll cheat on you or they'll do something right away or or a few months in and turn around and leave you Exactly. And usually, you know, they're going to financially abuse you. They're going to do all the things they always do. They're just going to do it faster. I think that's the thing that people don't realize about narcissists, and that's mainly coming from the empath side, is they want to be able to connect to love, to get that relationship back, to get the love bombing back that's not going to come back because, like, that was love bombing. But, like, I think the thing that's, like, hard for people to realize is, like, if you get to the place where you realize, like, hey, like, I want – I want the narcissist to feel my pain. Okay. Like, that's not going to happen. Or like, you want to get to the place of like, I want the narcissist to, I want to stick it to the narcissist. Okay. Like if you're, if you have an exit strategy, or if you're leaving, the best way to stick it to a narcissist is to go no contact, completely Mm -hmm. no contact and not have any way for them to contact you because will they move on? Yes. Will they find a new supply? Yes. Will it still eat them up to some level? hundred percent. And so like, if you want to think about it, like the one way, This probably is not good therapy advice. The one way to get back at a narcissist is to go full no contact because like there's a part of it that will eat them alive that you pulled the plug first and that they didn't have the chance to have the last word because they lost control in that situation and they lost the person. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, love bombing isn't love. You know, looking back now, the very first time that this person raised his voice at me should have been the last time that I ever saw him. Um, my partner and I have been together for a year. There has never been raised voice. There's been conversations, you know, but like the fact that the love bombing You know, you'll notice too if 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 you've ever gone back, and most of us have gone back more than once, 
the love bombing is less like impressive <laughs> if you want to use that word and the abuse cycle tightens up and it just you know it's not love so they don't think of you that way it's not they're obsessed with getting you back because they love you they're they might be obsessed because they're furious that you did it to them first but you know so the control for sure yeah um the vine queen asks how many supplies supplies does a narcissist have on average a year it, i mean it really depends like you know if if you get one good supply that can last you for multiple years like you know if the uh, i don't know if you haven't tapped all of what you're trying to tap in one sense like it's going to keep happening until the well runs dry and you move on to something else like it's not necessarily a uh uh mm. one thing now that's not to say that it's only going to be one like it's going to be multiple at times depending on the person depending on the situation but but yeah it really just depends on what they're what they want to get out of it um would they take me going on vacation that they didn't want me going on as leaving uh possibly or they might take it as a opportunity to do whatever they want um i know i have done that in the past and it's not good yeah, and Narc Free is saying that supply can also be children, anyone they can abuse. I know in the situation with the ex sociopath I was with, his mother and father were his prime, like I would seriously consider them primary supply or forever supply, actually, is probably what I should say. Um, and yeah, that they will use their children that way too until the children cut them off, which will probably, which happens a lot. Um, but usually the kids are more like in their 30s, like early 30s late 20s or somewhere early to mid 30s when they really put it all together um but yeah anybody can be supply it could be like literally the gro the grocery store clerk who always says you know who they think is flirting with them that can be supply like every you know yeah. but um being grade a supply when we refer to that i know you and i talked about that before Grade A supply is not a compliment. So grade A supply means you're the one who's putting up with almost the, the, the majority of their BS, and it's usually the partner. Yeah, very true. Um, someone asked if, if my, am, am I really trauma recovery with Mimi? They asked, am I really an Enneagram 2 or am I just codependent? Um, I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I mean, Enneagram 2 is known typically as being, like, helpful. Um, sometimes they might be codependent, but you could have any of them be codependent. Um, everybody's everybody's one type on the Enneagram, like, one through nine. Everybody's one of those, and there's not one that's good, and there's not one that's bad. It's just this is how this person thinks or acts or their longings, desires, weakness, things like that. Um, it's never a bad thing, and there's there's healthy Enneagrams one through nine and there's unhealthy Enneagrams one through nine. Like it's, it's all over the place, but like having understanding which Enneagram you might be really does help you understand sometimes what makes you tick and like what actually is going on inside at times. Um, Cindy asked, do they all cheat? Um, I know I don't always have like the, the most popular answer because a lot of people, I don't think everybody agrees with me on this, but I say, yes. <laughs> um, I say narcissists all cheat, but I, I clarify that with different levels. So like there might be a narcissist that cheats by having an affair. There might be a narcissist that cheats by having an emotional affair. There might be a narcissist that, that cheats by putting work above his partner or like, I think there's, I think there's different levels of it in one sense, but I think like when you boil it down to the aspect of cheating, as far as like, they're going to put something or someone or themselves higher and more important than your relationship, then in reality, they are robbing you of that time. They're robbing you of that emotion. They're robbing you of that um, relationship. So I say typically that all narcissists do cheat. Um, what happens when you threaten a narcissist? Bad things. Don't do it. It's not worth it. Does the nar narcissist eventually forgive you when they've already punished you for something. No. <coughs> um, no. No. So especially if it comes along those lines of like betrayal to the narcissist, even if it's not betrayal, if they determine it in their, in their mind that you betrayed them, then you're like on the road to being dead to them. 
Well, and like you just said, in their mind, right? Like a lot of times the cheating narcissists are going to blame their partners for cheating when they're not, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they, they will, I have another draft in there about like, it's exhausting trying to defend yourself against things you've never said, never thought and never done. So like in a lot of cases, a narcissist will make shit up in their head because they're doing shit. They're doing things they shouldn't be doing. They're cheating. They're abusing. They're whatever. So they'll make things up about you to be mad about to make it even. That was a big thing with the one I was with and with my mother as well. Everybody had to take equal responsibility. Every It had to be even. And it's like there is no even or equality between abuse and the person being abused. So if they convince themselves that you've done something, they're not going to forgive you for something you never did because they accuse you of doing something you've never done, you know? Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Someone's, yeah, they're trying to tell the truth about the abuse and what happens. So like, yeah, that's when the narcissist is going to go on the smear campaign and try to make sure that whatever, whatever truth you're trying to show they can smear it and get people on their side. Yeah, you got blamed for his cheating, even though well, it moved, even though his needs are being met. Yeah, for sure. Like you'll like if the narc if the narc is cheating, then nine times out of ten, he's going to find a way to blame you for cheating, even if you're not cheating, just so that he can feel better and justify in his mind of like, oh, she's probably cheating, so it's okay that I'm cheating. So sinful is here. Hey, sin. It's so nice to see you. So um, go watch Sinful. Um, if you don't follow her, which I'm sure you do because she's phenomenal. Um, she was just featured in the New York Times today. We're all really, really proud of you. That's exciting. <laughs> so Ben, um, Elise is asking if narcissists feel guilt. Um, I'd say like typically no, but like typically what happens is like the guilt is switched into shame which switches into rage and stuff really quickly um which makes me think of like what i have on on my wall of like triggers here field trip real quick i don't i don't think you've ever seen my office but it's uh it's all it's all whiteboards so i've got like two sections here that's all whiteboards and then i've got one section over here and let me see if you can see this. Can I flip it around on a live or no? I am. Oh, I can flip camera. Okay. All right. So real quick, let me show you real quick here. So typically, what happens is you have something that's you have something that's happening, okay, and then you have a trigger event. You have something that triggers a narcissist or just triggers a person in general. This can apply to like other people too, but like for a narcissist in particular, you have a triggering event. Then you have like immediate response a lot of times like anger, then you blame, then you have guilt, and then you have shame. And so it kind of like goes in that order. So what happens typically with a narcissist is a lot of times they'll feel the guilt, it'll it'll come out in blaming and having anger, and then they'll feel shame. And when they feel shame, you drop down into something which is like the pit. So like the worst of the worst, the place where they're going to be, and then all they want to do is figure out how do I get back? How do I get back to originally where I was? Because where I originally was, I was better. So it's called the false lift. So they end up figuring out, how do I get back? So typically, this is your place of where they're going to be like love bombing. They're going to be trying to do anything they can to get back to the place. So they tell themselves a story. They make a lie, and they get back to the place where they were. And then they're, But what they don't realize is they're not any better. They're exactly where they started, which is long this path that's going to run straight into this trigger runs us back around again. Wow. See, this is what I'm saying. Like, I think you would be a really good coach. <laughs> yeah, Sin, Sin is saying that that makes so much sense. Um, maybe not even, I mean, I could see you being a, a good coach. Like I have clients and Sinful and some of the rest of us do for, um, mine mostly is inner child work, you know, um, inner voice, inner critic, exit strategy, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I could see you doing good coaching with ex- how like you explain things is really helpful. But, you know, even for, I mean, other narcissists, although I don't know if you want to work with other narcissists or not, but I don't know. It's just a thought. It keeps coming to me that you'd be a good coach. That was like really helpful. 
Maybe you could do video on that because honestly, that was helpful. I totally share that. Okay, I need to. I've been like, I've been like thinking about it. Like honestly, I, I want to. I wanted to have like. I need to do a video where I actually like people seem to like write it. I feel like that would be like the most effective to actually write it. But like, that's something. Can you hear me? I'm like one of them's dying on here. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm still not connected. Um, like that's one of the things that I that I took from and started like looking at from the group that I'm in the wake up warrior challenge. And I've, I've talked about that on some, someone here. And like, I know some people have been like, Oh, like it's a scam. It's not a scam. It's, it's crazy. And honestly, without, without that, without God and without another friend in my life, like I wouldn't be here today. Like I wouldn't be in this spot because mm -hmm. like that really like put me through a bunch of stuff of like, Hey, like I need to stop lying. I need to get rid of the lies. This one's not connecting for some reason. Um, and so like that was. Hey, hang on real quick. I just want to say yeah. before I lose it. So sinful is saying that she wants to do edit. She said that diagram was helpful AF. So yeah, I think a few of us want to want, want that. All right. So I'll see about doing a video. Doing a video. <laughs> Thank you. But yeah, like that's, that's something that, that's something that I picked up and, yeah. and developed from, from uh, the wake up warrior challenge, which is, Fantastic. Mm -hmm. I would encourage anybody to go through it. It's really, it's worth the money. Um, so Elise is asking if narcissists can develop friendship, close friendships. I will just tell you what I've observed growing up with um, uh, cluster B parents and then being married to one. Um, my parents had new best friends every two years. It was almost like clockwork. I think um, after, after the first year that they would have new friends or new couple friends, they would start to figure them out. They would see them less and less. All of a sudden, the parents were telling us, because we were always told to call them aunt and uncle so-and-so, that, you know, well, they were just not the people that we thought they were. And, you know, they, you know, with my mother, with her whole attitude. And then, you know, just like my father would just be like, yeah, you know, they, they, they're dirty people. They did, a, they, you know, we don't trust them, blah, blah. Then they get a new couple and then it would just repeat. My, the ex that I was with, he has like friends from high school, but like they never see each other. Like maybe I think I've seen all of them. And one of them doesn't even live that far away from us. I think four times in nine years, like don't even, don't talk on the phone anything and then the only other friends he has are his bandmates and again we only were ever invited to go out with them like twice although the women that i was friends with invited me to go places um i don't think that they and most narcs not all but most really can't it's because they'd have to put something into the friendship in order to maintain it so i've never seen um that in my experiences that they are able to have anyone close they have more like acquaintances or people they'll go out to lunch with stuff like that but that might be a very different situation depending on the person because somebody who's more grandiose maybe has a really easy time making friends and you know if they're especially charming um i just think that uh, my parents and my ex could just couldn't keep up the act long enough so i don't know what do you think ben no i think that, i think that makes sense cuz like, you have like a period of time where you realize your effectiveness as a narcissist has run its course and you either move on or you have to admit who you actually are so it's a lot easier to move on mhm mm it's probably i mean probably not hard to make friends right like that probably no, because the I mean, part. I, I think like making friends is like your, how you make friends, how you make like relationships and stuff like that is like baseline, uh, how do I say it? I would say like baseline healthy manipulation, but like a narcissist takes that to an unhealthy way where they use the same tactics that you would to make a friend into a way to make a trauma bond, into a way to make a forever friend that thinks that they can't live without you kind of a thing it's the same uh it's the same like method it just has evil intent behind it a lot of times so like elise is asking so essentially it's mirroring and in in some some little bits of it's a, it's not that different from a partner i mean the the way that you go about that is the same yeah is that what you're saying i think so <laughs> Um, <laughs> the, the mirroring threw me off. I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily mirroring. It can be mirroring. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to explain this. All right, let's try this. Um, so like, think of it this yeah. way. 
Like, if I want to, if I want to connect with you, I'm going to figure out something that we have in common or something I can make that we have in common that I can connect with you on. So like in a perfect environment. So like if you're interacting face to face, you're going to have some type of interaction or like in a work environment or in a friend group or something like that, you're going to have some interaction that I can connect with you or have like a slight moment. So say like, say like we're out like with a bunch of friends and we're getting ice cream or something like that. And okay, let's make it really simple. Like you're, you're pouring the ice cream and you accidentally spill some of the ice cream. Okay. And like I make a joke or we laugh about it or something like that. The next time I see you, I'm going to find some way to work in the conversation, that same joke, that same illustration back to the original thing that for a split second, the first time we had a slight connection so I like, I massage that. I touch on that just a little bit more the following time. And then boom, we've got a little bit more connection. One, because I remembered. Two, because you remembered. Mm -hmm. And three, because that little connection was there is all of a sudden magnified by the time that's passed in between. Mm -hmm. So yep. the problem is you have healthy relationships that have those interactions and it's okay. But the unhealthy ones is when the narcissist is using that for a type of connection, manipulation, control. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So it's just, it's the difference is it's disingenuous that you're, or it's not natural. You're using, you're, you're using something to get closer to that person as opposed to like, I'm not adding like value it's calculated. to you. I'm manipulating value for me. Ah, that's, that's interesting. That's a good way to put that. Like me bringing that up and building that connection isn't technically building you up. It's not technically helping you. It's not growing you. It's not supporting you. It's me making sure that I can get you to connect with me so that I feel better about myself. So it all comes back around to you. Well, yeah, it's the narcissist. Remember? <laughs> You're like, duh. <laughs> I mean, as, a, as a narc, it's all about the narc. It's like, as a narc, it's all about me. And so until I get to that point where I'm like, okay, the well, world yeah. doesn't revolve around me, that's when you start realizing like, hey, like there can be change, there can be growth, there can actually be a new future than what I'm currently living in. But up until so, like S starting Cynthia to realize this, like the world did revolve around me. Like that's what I thought, basically. Sid says, ugh, LOL. Um, Donna Beers, I did a video on not staying friends with the narcissist a few weeks ago. It should have a title on it. Or or when the narcissist wants to stay friends, um, definitely you might want to watch that if you just want some um, some support in that you made the right decision to not stay friends after years. Um, and also I just followed you. I try to follow everybody who comes in here. Um, oh, I forget to do that half the time. Let's see. There you go. Um, someone just asked about, sorry, this is going to make me laugh for a while. The way you said, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, sometimes it's hard, like, again, like that's just like the transparency of like, sometimes it's hard not to be like, you know, like, Duh, like, who do you think I am? But, like, you know, obviously responding that way a lot of times is not helpful. And, like, I'm not on here to be, like, triggering for other people either. But, like. No, no, it was yeah. funny. It was um, funny. <laughs> uh, Snowy says, so when they accuse you of cheating, do they actually think you're cheating? Or is it just their guilty conscience? Um, yes, it's their guilty conscience wanting to justify it by actively thinking that you're cheating. So like it all kind of like ties back together. Like if I can lie to myself and convince myself that you're cheating, then I feel better about myself. And then I don't have to tell you about it because like, yeah, like she probably is doing this or yeah, she's probably texting this guy or like, you know, this is probably, yeah, she probably has a snap streak with him because she actually likes him on some level. So like what I'm doing fine. Or I noticed like also they'll start picking at you for like even more ridiculous things than they already were before. It's almost like they're trying to find a way to make you bad to justify what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, like, honestly, I got told that I was not folding um, his boxers uh, the way that he liked on purpose. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, then you know what we're going to do? Then we're you do your laundry, I do mine. How's that? Because, like, honestly, like, it was just, like, stuff like that. Though. I'm not sure. Hmm. said so i don't know if i ever said it to kayla i might have though i know i like 
definitely like showed her i was like no like this is how you fold my shirts because this is not done the right way you know but well with the case of my ex he would then just change it so you know he didn't like corn on the cob this week but he loved uh, it yeah. next week and he hated it the week after so sinful ones didn't do you actually start to literally believe it when you tell yourself that enough like that your wife is cheating yeah absolutely. or when you used like you to get to the, you get to the place where you can believe anything you you tell yourself a lie so many times you get to the place that becomes reality and that's the hard thing is with narcissists a lot of times they lie to themselves so much they get to the place that they have a new reality they have a new face they have a new look they have a new personality because they've built that they've built that around like other people other relationships uh tv shows movies like literally like you name it like they can sponge up yeah. stuff and end up being like, hey, this is the person I want to be. Or, you know, in the case of like your sociopath, like, hey, this is the person I want to be this week, you know, <laughs> because like it literally mm -hmm. it literally gets to the place where they believe they believe the reality that they've created. And that's that's the hardest thing. And I think that's why a lot of narcissists aren't self-aware and why a lot of people can't get through them, because like if you believe um, Inception, it's a perfect example like and I remember you telling the, me that the, yeah the when you go all the way down into the deep levels the guy's wife believed that she was actually there to the point where she was willing to jump off the ledge and like killed herself because like mm -hmm. she thought that that was actually the place she told herself lie after lie after lie of no this is actually reality I mean that one's a little bit more psychological it's messing with their mind stuff like that but like it's the same I, idea I love that movie with, yeah with the narcissism mm -hmm. is like if you lie to yourself so much, you get to the place that you believe it. You get to the place that that's your reality. You get to the place you don't know how to even break past that because it is your reality. I'm so glad you're talking about this. I mean, I'm not, I don't mean to say it, but it would be another good video idea because I think that would take notes. That's why it's so good. Con video. I need to like write. Okay. <laughs> I'm always going to forget. Well, first, you're going to do, you're going to write out that, um, you're going to write out your, um, that wheel. Okay with the pit right i can't remember the other one um but then talking about this like almost this like false reality hmm. maybe or alternate reality because that's what's so freaking confusing to victims because we're like that literally never happened right. or like i you know here's your text messages that you sent this is actually what you said no i didn't you said that no, I didn't. And you're like, what? Like, we're like, and it's so, um, and you know, like the mind game part of it, right? So a lot of times to the victim, it literally, it, it is that they are doing mind games on purpose, right? To gaslight you and, to you know, get you uh, all upset and like questioning yourself. But what you're saying is sometimes it's legit, like they legitimately believe this stuff because it's there's so many layers to it that they don't they don't re actually remember the reality. That's I think there's I mean, always like a sliver there, but I think the more mm -hmm. you the more you lie, the longer you do it, the easier it is to like quench that inner voice that might be like, hey, like this might not be true. Like if you keep shoving that to the side, eventually like you're not going to hear it. Interesting. I mean, it's sad. Yeah, it's for for everyone, but that's. Uh, how do narcs hold on to so much unforgiveness and still manage to look carefree and happy? Disassociation. I mean, really, just like that that unforgiveness, that anger, that frustration, all goes into. Well, this is how I am. This is the victim personality. But like, in order to get friends and have people like me, they can't see that. Um, a lot of disassociation in a lot of, in a lot of different ways. So I have a question for you. Um, the question is, do narcissists actually feel emotion? I'll let Ben do the full answer. But what I would say to that is I, I feel like that's all they are is emotion. It's they're they're It's not that they don't have emotion. They're filled with like, I think you just hopped on. I don't know if you saw what Ben said before, but you know, shame, anger, rage, fear, like they're filled with emotion. It's just not um the way that we would think of it but do you want to take that on i was gonna say like growing up like i was always pegged as being like the non-emotional one and didn't have emotions but like a lot of times it was because i didn't show those emotions um mm -hmm. now again in the moment don't equate emotions with empathy 
like keep those two right. separate in this conversation. But like, like growing up, like my parents would like be like, you know, they they would make like a, a quote unquote like joke about like you know, it was rare to ever see me, like, show a bunch of emotion. It was rare to see me, like, cry or anything like that. Like, growing up, like, those were, like, very, very, very few and far between. And, like, emotion just wasn't something that people thought that I experienced or had. And a lot of times for me, like, emotion was something that I experienced. But for me, how I viewed it or how I internalized it was that I viewed whatever emotion I was dealing with was something that was, like, much bigger than what everybody else could think about or like much deeper than what I could comprehend. And that's why the majority of the time, like any emotions I felt were always experienced in private after the fact, or sometimes before the fact, you know, like, um, like I might not have emotion at like a death in the family because I might've already processed that emotion mentally in my mind, like three months before kind of thing. So mm-hmm. then like when it happened, mm-hmm. there was no emotion because like I already processed that next that kind of thing and two like if if because a lot of nar- narcissists grow up just the way a lot of codependent empaths do when um it's a tra- it's a traumatic household so like like I we were taught that we had to push like everything had to get pushed down you you were only allowed to act happy and if you weren't happy and you weren't putting on the happy face for the abusive parents, then there was going to be all kinds of consequences to that. So, I mean, in some cases, it can be that the narcissist learns early just the way some of us have that you can, you don't show those emotions. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean, right? So they're just, they're there, but you're not showing them. Um, I think, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people are saying that's how it was in their homes. It's really too bad. None of us deserve that, <laughs> you know. Well, up. so do you do you know what time it is? <laughs> ben and I had a, a we had a brief converse we had a conversation about this a while ago that we would keep the sessions briefer, like half an hour. <laughs> And so far, that has not once happened. <laughs> it's, it's always at least an hour and a half. How do you feel and know if they are being real with you? Any signs? We're both like, we don't want to answer. Um, like... Uh, if they're being real with you, then you're going to notice step-by-step long-lasting change. If you don't see that, then they're not being real. Um, I'd say change and effort because you could have someone Mm -hmm. who is giving effort that maybe doesn't have the right people around them, the right therapist or something like that to get there. But, the effort will still be there of like, okay, I need to find something. I need to figure this out, you know? Um, But step-by-step change, like the change has to be consistent and constant versus just, you know, five steps forward, 20 steps back kind of thing. Yeah. And Sin is saying the same thing, consistent actions to match the words. It's, I mean, that's the biggest thing Mm -hmm. that I learned too. you know, this guy and and what they don't realize is every single time they promise that they're going to do something, even if it's something small, like I promise that I'll take out the garbage this time or whatever. Um, I promise I'll help you paint your new office. And then it never happens. Stuff like that. Like they don't realize like every little at every time they promise you something and they don't follow through you trust them less Mm -hmm. it's different than oh geez i forgot about that baby i'll go take care of that it's it's perfect like they're never they're just going to say what you want to hear in the moment right for whatever they want to get from you so yeah it has to be action it has to be like it can't be well i went to three therapy sessions so you know i've done therapy like you it has to be long term and then you have to also not just go to therapy but you have to apply it you have to do the homework you know you have to come home and if therapist tells you to read a book you have to read the book you can't not do it right so yeah yeah 
So um, the Vine Queen asked, how long can a narcissist dissociate from their emotions? And don't have a time limit on that, but I'd say a very long time <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, and I, I was trying to think if there would be like an event or something that would make them like stop or like change or like have it like bubble out or over overwhelm but like i don't really have a time frame like it can go on for a long period of time because there's people that dissociate for six months and there's people that dissociate for like 15 years you know and Mm -hmm. i would say i would guess that typically eventually it comes out um as far as like the dissociating like eventually the emotions like bubble over come out or they or they come out in other ways you just don't realize it you know, this rage is connected to this emotion or something like that. Mm-hmm. But it's sad. Yeah, at least. Sorry about my dog chewing on his bone in the background. No, you're uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, we've been on for two hours. Yeah, I think we're... A little over. I think we're coming to the end. Yeah, um, but wow, we've we've had a lot of... Thank you, everybody who... Who wanted engagement. to be a moderator and help answer questions, huh? I said there's just there's been a lot of engagement, a lot of good questions. Yeah, this has been really great. For sure. Yeah, I feel like we need so, to do. I feel like we need to do one sometime where we like advertise, like we're going to talk about like Enneagram, like specifically, or we need to do one where we see about um, doing like the the invite and have people like join and like ask questions or talk through. Whatever. I love that idea. I think it'd be kind of cool. Yeah, and um, I think it seems like everybody was interested in that. So, yeah, wait, yeah, Elizabeth, you're not, you're not crazy. Yeah, listen to Dan. Not crazy. You're looking for answers. You're looking to heal. Mm-hmm. Um. So, so Donna Beers, thank you. So usually, um, usually Ben and I do it every Thursday. I'm just a long COVID survivor so sometimes i have flare-ups and the last thursday i had a really bad flare-up and i could not couldn't do it <laughs> you wouldn't i couldn't even um but i think we I, I i always have it on my calendar for thursdays and then we just kind of double check and make sure if both of us are still good yeah i think thursday um, typically works um and we normally go on like eight thirty or so so Sometimes I wonder Eastern. if, like, sometimes I wonder if, like, that time works best because I do feel sometimes that, like, as we get later, sometimes we get more engagement, more people on. I don't know if we should sometimes start later, um, like just. You back mean it like up. nine o'clock, like we did? Yeah, like I don't know if I don't know the best time to get on here, you know. But yeah. Well, I did look this time, and I, it did say that I had twelve point seven thousand followers were on at the time we went live. Okay. But some of the people in here are saying they're in Central, and I know, like, some are um, on Pacific. So if we did start at 9 so Central instead of 8.30. 10 o'clock? 10.30 right now? No, they the would way? be 8. Yeah, no. it's the other way. Oh, yeah. So, like, if it's 9 o'clock, then Central would be, okay, yeah, 8. So if we start at 9, or then the people that are in Pacific time would be 6. So maybe that would give them a little bit of time to get home. Maybe that's why we get more some dinner like, later because there's more people across the U.S. like off work and I don't, know, mm. I don't know how many people are in like Pacific time that are on here. But yeah. Oh, I have one person say I yes. think Dan is. Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, geez, Drew, I didn't know that. You... I got central time on here. Okay, so we have something else to talk about then. I did not know that you are a COVID survivor. I'm sorry if you have long haul symptoms. It's terrible. Good therapy session. <laughs> Dude, I know I owe you an email. My whole schedule got so slammed because I was sick the week before that I've like hardly had any time um, in between clients. So you are definitely on my list of people. And Mimi, that goes for you too. I Both of your emails are starred as things I need to respond to. So we'll, we'll do our dual lives together, I promise. Oh, Dan's on Mountain Time. Okay. So that's... Does it, is it like 11.25, or I'm sorry, 9.25 for you, Dan? Yes, so no, that would we, be typically, we typically go live every week. Um, I need to look at my calendar and see if I can do next week on Thursday, to be honest. So okay. I've got... If not, we can do it the following. 
I think I have fam. I've got family coming. Oh, next week, next Thursday's no uh, Thursday's my birthday. Actually, that's cool. Oh. But yeah, um, yeah. I'll have to double check. I probably won't be we'll able do- to do it next Thursday because they'll be in town. Um. I can always do a Monday or Tuesday. Um. I could, but it have to I be just like can't do Wednesdays and Sundays. Sunday, Sunday through Tuesday, I go to bed at like nine because I have to wake up. Oh, at that's 1:30. right. So like that. Makes All right. Well, we'll figure it out. It sounds like everybody is enjoying this, and we sure love having everybody here. Bye, Dan. Because yeah, yeah, I don't know. We'll play it by ear and kind of figure out. So. I wish there was like a good like afternoon time. I think you mentioned like even like a Saturday sometime, but I think it'd be like hit or miss like getting people on here. Um you know, during the afternoon. I mean, I see people live all throughout the day. I can do during the day if you and I plan it ahead of time. I just have to block out my calendar because my clients schedule me. Mm-hmm. So if I don't block it out ahead of time, then I can't control I can't control oh, okay. it. They can get in whatatever they want. So that makes but sense. if I block it, if I block off time, then then that that isn't shown as a possible time on their Calendly link. So we could look at Yeah, Tuesday. we can try and I mean we could what's the worst thing that happens, you know? I mean it doesn't matter as long as we're helping some people. Um Right. It's fine. We can always give it a give it a shot. Or yeah, sure. like Saturdays, like we said. Yeah, I mean I've been trying to figure out like I've been trying to think long term too of like how can how can we help people? How can I help people like even like more and stuff like that. I mean I looked a while back and I I think I have it set up on my profile, like under my, uh, whatever is it, link tree underneath my bio of like a, a Wizio account or whatever. Cause I saw like Lee had one of those like early on. But, yeah. Like, Matt know, told me to, to look into that too, but I don't know. There's so much, um, I, mean, I think it's a great platform, right? but I just haven't had time to do it. Yeah. I don't, I don't know for sure. I've been working too over the past like week. I've been slowly working on, I'm revamping. Um, well, I'm starting and revamping my, my Instagram and then I'm starting up YouTube as well. So I can try to get more consistency on the yeah. platforms. No headed. Well, going. will I you stay on my case and someone, someone will you stay on my me. case? Yeah. You need to post. On will YouTube. you stay on my case about YouTube? Right. Because I need to get my YouTube going, like bug me about it. Yeah, for sure. And then we can do this on YouTube too. Sounds good. Yeah, what I've I've been doing, I I try to I put it under a I put it under like a, a folder or channel or whatever, but like I've been trying every time we do a live to save the live down and then throw it up on YouTube. I don't know how helpful it is seeing like you know, just a long live, but I feel like if anybody wanted to go back and rewatch or kind of see some of these conversations it oh, might be helpful. So That's a good idea. But yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll have to talk more on that. That's that's good. Um all right, so we'll figure out if there's an alternate date that Ben and I can work out together next week. We'll do that, but otherwise it would be two weeks from today. And maybe we will start at 9 or 9.30 so that those of you that are not in Eastern time have time to settle in and get home from work and have some dinner with the kids, bed, all that kind of stuff. So um, Yeah, just the next like month, we're just going to have to play it by ear a lot. So, cause- That's fine with me. Two weeks from yesterday, so the the October sixth, I actually have a eye surgery, so that'll be interesting. Oh, so yeah, it shouldn't be too crazy. They're like going in, like taking out floaters on my left eye. I've got like floaters that like affect my vision on that eye, and they've gotten like really bad. But um, the recovery isn't supposed to be bad. I just have to wear glasses and not touch it, so it should be fine. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. wow. Well, good. I'm glad you're getting that done. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah we'll all right. So we will, what, but what we'll try to do is what, if we are doing it on a day different than a Thursday, we'll both do a video with that live right. countdown that you showed me how to do. Right. Um, and then if not, then, you know, we'll, we'll let you guys know, but, but for sure every other week. Yeah. So we'll figure it out. Sounds good. Cool. All right. Cool. Thanks. Well, thank you everybody. We love you very much. So thank glad you, all of you were here. Thank you to all the mods. It. We'll see you guys sometime. <laughs> so. All right, okay, talk to you later. Yeah.